Mahid. It's Tuesday, April 10, 2007. And my watch says 6.25 p.m. Mr. Jeff Port is present. And Ms. Councilwoman Garn is present. Councilwoman Roman is present. Vice Mayor Lozno, Councilman Hodge, and Councilwoman Bell. Item 2A is the approval of the March 27, 2007 minutes. Is there a motion for approval? I'll move the mayor. Moved by Councilwoman Bell. Is there a second? Second, mayor. Second by Councilwoman Garner. Any questions on the March 27 minutes? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Item 2B is a discussion on the EFBD. Thank you, Mayor. Councilwoman Bell? Yes. Thank, thank you, Mayor. I brought all of the, um, some of the major principles that serve on the EFBD board in some capacity here tonight so that we can have a very frank discussion on what is happening or has happened with the EFBD and the EFBD members. We have uh, with us now, and Taylor Smith, the EFBD manager, he will be addressing us in just a moment and he will be introducing everybody. But we have uh, the EFBD general counsel, we have Nelco Testing with us, we have Judy Brostoff, she's with the not-for-profit, and we have the chairman of the EFBD board, Mr. Eric Fresen, and we need to have a very frank discussion. We had an EFBD meeting today, and what, what we have encountered is a real, you know, I could call it a roadblock or say that we've hit a wall, but that, that would kind of uh, be an understatement if I were, were to say that. We have been working in good faith with the school system, school board, staff, um, for about, on this particular project, well over two years. And we've been, uh, I've been personally working on the EFBD for three, over three and a half years now. For, from the stages of formulation stages that the EFBD was already in the process of being worked on when I was elected and when the mayor appointed me to be chair of the education committee that became one of my tasks to work towards the passage of the EFBD which stands for Educational Facilities Benefit District. It is a special taxing district. We um, fought very hard for approval. We had to get approval from Dade County, um, Miami Dade County Commission, as well as the Dade County School Board. We did, and we've been working together. In fact, we have two appointees on the EFBD from the school board. One appointee is school board staff on the EFBD board, as well as representative from the city. I am one, one person on the EFBD board, one vote. I represent the city of Homestead. The EFBD was formed by an interlocal agreement with the city of Homestead, the school board of Dade County, and the Miami Dade County Commission. The, pro and the reason the EFBD formed was one reason and one reason only, and that is to build schools. It was not, it was not something we all wanted to do, work, very, work even harder and assemble ourselves constantly and go downtown and work very hard. We, we know it's the school board's job to build schools. But what was happening down here in Homestead was that that was not happening. Schools were just not being built in, uh, not only in South Dade, but schools were just not being built in Homestead. And the newest schools in town are two charter schools, and so we weren't getting our schools. So we were very excited and quite jubilant, if you will, when, when the EFBD was patched, passed. And there was some disagreement with different members of the city, and you know, there was a lot of a lack of understanding, but it was perceived very, pretty much as a good thing. We've been in the planning stages for about two years now on the first EFBD school. You've seen site work. You've seen the sign up there, the future site. Well, the school board um, staff denied us our funding. They would not release the EFBD funds. And we're going to go into that. But they just said that they would not release the funds until the entire site was conveyed to them. And there are some... There are some um, Arsenic, I think the, the main issue was arsenic, which is not uncommon to any building site in the entire South Dade community. Arsenic is naturally occurring, and I'm certainly not the, the, um, I'm certainly not the expert on this. I have a, a wonderful book in my hand that I've been uh, studying. But l let me tell you, we have been working in very, very, operating in very good faith with the school system. And unfortunately, I cannot honestly say the same on, on their behalf. It's been very difficult. And the last meeting, um, 
the, some principals of the EFBD and the chair, because we can only have one member of the EFBD attend meetings because we, we had sunshine issues. So Eric went and Judy went and a few others, and they basically said that they weren't going to fund it until the entire site was conveyed. So then we said, we'll release all of the funds so we can complete the work for the entire, both school sites. And they said, we're not going to release the funds until you complete the site. And we said, well, we can't complete the site without the funds. So they basically pulled the rug out from under us. Well, we decided that we had to go one last time back to staff. We have to go one last time back to staff. So uh, early in February, very early in February, Kurt Ivey and myself went downtown with our attorney, Gail Sirota, and um, Taylor Smith, we, we had him on, on the phone, as well as our school board member, Evelyn Greer, and um, Anna Craft, Rose Diamond, and a few other principals with the school board. And basically, um, we were told that they were not going to take that quote-unquote contaminated site. And the bottom line was, when we showed, told them, it's, it's no different than any other site. It's clean. The fact, the site that we're prepared to build on, we've gotten a, a total go-ahead from Durham. And I was told by Rose Diamond that Durham standards are not her standards. So she wasn't going to allow us to build until the entire 39 acres was cleaned, as, as I stated earlier. So we kind of went back and forth, and then she, the bottom line was this. Just simply release the impact fees that have been collected that really belong to the EFBD that are controlled by the school board school board staffers. So simply release the funds to us and let us complete the work and let's move on. We've been working in good faith. We even use the school board's prototype, the school board's builder, the school board's architect. Literally every hoop they asked us to jump through, we jumped through. We had already put out for RFP and then they said they didn't like the way we did the RFP. They wanted to do it their way. So we literally were doing everything that they had asked us to do. And my education committee members know that. I have a Wendy from the education committee sitting here because I've been giving them monthly updates on the EFBD and going back and forth. Well, that day when we said, you know, we need the dollars. We were then told, just in February, after two years, that Rose Diamond was not going to allow the EFBD to use as impact fees for any part of site remediation or any anything to do with that site, filling it, cleaning it, demucking it, whatever. That that they were not going to allow us. And then we responded with, I responded with. But that's what you do with impact fees that you collect. You did that with the new South Dade High School site. You did that with the new South Dade SS1 Middle School site. You've done that with the Naranja site. You've done that with the North Miami site. You've been able to take your impact fee dollars for, for site remediation. Why are you now telling the EFBD that it can't? Well, she then went on to say, we don't think you should, we're not going to allow you to use your assessments then you can't use the assessments. I then informed her that we haven't even collected assessments yet, which she wasn't aware of, and that assessments don't belong to her. They don't belong to the school system. Assessments belong to the EFBD, which they didn't really get it at that point either. So basically, there was um, it got kind of ugly, and I'm being kind, and um, school board staffers Kurt knows I almost lost my mind. Um, school board staffers called us incompetent and um, made another slur that they didn't think that we were going to overhear. And so I stood up and addressed that comment. And with the fact is that we've been working with the school board staffers, with them. This has been a joint interlocal project. And so Rose Diamond then said, you're not getting the money. She told us we are not getting the money. As a matter of fact, as we were getting up, she said, I, I'm taking, I've already pulled Pertle off, I've pulled everybody off, um, no construction is going to take place, and I'm taking the dollars, I'm taking the EFBD dollars, and I'm going to put them into um, concretables, um, I think she said Campbell Middle, but I'm not sure. I'm going to take them and I'm going to use them in another school. So she told us flat out that they were taking away our dollars. So we have had meeting after meeting, and we figured that we're, we're, we're at a great impasse. And so we had a, um, an EFBD meeting today, and the EFBD, all the members, and e including two of the school board representatives who were appointed by school board members, voted to bring a, a, a motion to the floor 
to begin the discussions of dissolving the EFBD. And we are going to, the, the, the land right now is owned by the not-for-profit. Because they wouldn't release the, the funds, we had to form the Homestead Educational Facilities Benefit District, the HEFBD, to borrow funds to pay people who have been working on site prep. We have attorneys, we have managers, we have a bond council to pay their bills. So we had to do that. So the, the not-for-profit owns the school site. So we, we have another solution that we think is going to get schools. My promise to the community is schools. And, and that's what we're going to do. That is what we're going to do. We are not going to stop. We're going to get schools. Unfortunately, they really pulled the rug out from under us at the, at the 11th hour, and we still are not quite sure why. And at the meeting today, I had one, we had one of the attorneys from the school board said, well, why don't we have a, a meeting, another meeting? And it was just... It was just amazing. We've been through so many meetings. And what happens with the school board staffers, we found out, is this person was in a meeting this time, but not this time. And then this person, this staffer, was, this attorney was in this meeting, so this attorney and this attorney don't know what, what each other is doing. So the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. So with that, with that introduction, I wanted to give you a great overview on what's happening. I'm going to turn it over to Taylor Smith, who's going to uh, allow everybody to speak. And we also have our engineers, our, our environmental engineers here as well. Thank you, Taylor. Thanks. I'm Taylor I Smith. I didn't tell too much. No, that's fine. I'm Taylor Smith, and I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, I guess for the record, 1819 Goodwin Street, Jacksonville, Florida. And I am the district manager for the EFBD. <clears throat> I wanted to give you, uh, Council, a brief overview as well from my perspective. And that is to say there's good news and bad news. The good news is because of Linda and her tireless efforts, and they really are unpaid, voluntary, tireless efforts, <clears throat> the course of action that's been taken has created an opening of the school in 2008. We always had planned on opening the school in 07 and then because of issues not related to this but issues related to the Panther and some of the permitting with the U.S. Corps, the Army Corps, we were delayed for, for those reasons, not construction reasons. The school board has written off this school for now. I mean, they, they don't have a solution and they have abandoned us in every way except for uh, verbal platitudes, if you will, and willingness to meet in perpetuity. They may or may not really be able to do other things, but to suffice it to say, we are all here tonight to say there's no evidence of action from the school board, but because of uh, Ms. Bell, nothing has been lost, and that's the good news. The good news is we have a site which has been donated. It's in the hands of a nonprofit, which your city manager is one of the directors, and Judy is one of the directors, and Ray Melindy, who works for Lennar, is one of the directors. All three have the only intent of getting a school on that site. So that land is now controlled by a nonprofit. That's step one. It's fully permitted with the U.S. Corps, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers. All of the mitigation for wetlands, all of that, which took 19 months, is done. It's all done and approved and, and out of behind us. We also have um, partial fill in the site, which is necessary to build a school, sufficient enough to actually five acres. We have enough land now to build a school and open in 08. That's, that's another good news point. I like to start with the good news. Um, <clears throat> the nonprofit has been approached by and has done due diligence on and vetted a charter school operator who can literally step into the shoes of the school board and complete the construction and open the school in 08 which is really phenomenal if you think about it. So we've actually, as a community, not missed a beat. Um, there's been a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. And it's confusing to me because I work in multiple districts around the state. I've never seen this happen where you have a bureaucracy. Probably every individual has good intentions, but no individual is able to affect their side of the deal. And so what you have is a structure of, a non, of an EFBD, which is nothing more than a funding conduit. Right. It's you as a city joining with the school board and joining with the county to consolidate funds and spearhead them onto a site to build a school and leverage those funds. Well, without the school board, there's no funding because they actually control all of the impact fees, even though they're allocated to the EFBD and we cannot operate in that fashion. Now what's interesting is 
They've also said through the EFBD conduit, you can't do a charter school. They locked that out. So now we find ourselves in this dilemma, catch-22. The EFBD can't serve its purpose because it can't secure the funds. It has no more function, and in a way it's becoming a hindrance because we need to have a charter school on this piece of land, which will open in 08, which will do all the things that you as a city want. Seats on that site open as quickly as possible. On a site that's approved by the city from transportation purposes, approved by the city from safety, fire and safety code, and all of those issues stay the same. Park facilities that are used by the community after hours, still part of the deal. So really, from a community's perspective, athletic fields that are used by the community after hours, we've not missed a beat, and that's good. The bad news is we've spun our wheels in this structure of an EFBD for two years and have not been able to secure the school board partnership, what was intended to be. Everything that we've done to permit the site, to get the Army Corps, to put the fill in place, everything that we've done has been done by the nonprofit with money borrowed by the nonprofit. And it's ironic, but we actually have opened a bank account. We've had a bank account open with the EFBD, and we've had zero balance from day one. We've never had a penny come into this organization. Hindsight's 20-20. You know, we should have perhaps thought about the Miami-Dade School Board a little differently when we started, but we dealt with what we could, and we've given it a good shot. So the action that you're being asked to consider came out of today's meeting, and as Linda said, the board of the EFBD has asked the city to pass a resolution, not even a resolution, just take action to dissolve the interlocal. If you don't, there are four parties in the interlocal, the city, the county, the school board, and the EFBD. If the city, and the city has the closest grassroots investment for its own citizens to have a school there. So the EFBD, out of courtesy, desired the city to say, yes, we want the school, it needs to go, you know, and so we'll dissolve the EFBD. Failing that, the EFBD will get back together and dissolve itself. Sorry, not dissolve itself, but it will cancel and terminate the interlocal, which is tantamount to dissolving. The school project's going to happen. I mean, the nonprofit is close now, I gather, to arranging a relationship with a charter school operator that we're told has a charter, has facilities all over Dade County, has funds, can step into the shoes of the school board, really, and finish the job. So, you know, in a way, I've worked myself out of a job because when the EFBD evaporates, actually because we have no money, I'm a volunteer anyway, but as the EFBD evaporates, you know, the school continues and the city has one less bureaucratic involvement that it has to be in. It actually simplifies the process. You become an overseer as a stakeholder of a charter school. No financial investment by the city, you know what I mean, but you are here as the normal permitting, planning, all of your controls are in place to make sure this facility is built and works and operates. So, I mean, I've got a letter. Ms. Bell and Kurt went to meet with the school board after we sent a letter on January 31st asking the chairman of the school board to please release the funds so that we could continue the project. That was January 31st. We've had no correspondence since then, but we brought copies for you because it has in it a timeline and a background of what happened. So, really, the good news overshadows the bad news. We're not here tonight saying close the EFBD and there's no school. We're here tonight saying you need to dissolve the EFBD so that the school can be successful and so that there's not a shell of a special purpose entity sitting out there with no function, which is not a good idea. And so I've got these to hand out. And then our general counsel is here that has met with your counsel to confirm how you do this step. It's very simple. Judy is here, like Linda said. She's with the nonprofit, can answer questions. The chairman of the EFBD is here. He can answer questions. Very importantly, as a community stakeholder, overseer, city, NELCO is here. They have a letter and quotes from Durham that say this site is fine for a school. And that's really important, city, for you to know. There is no stakeholder pushing for an inappropriate use of this land. 
No one here has any purpose or vested interest in developing this land for a school inappropriately, meaning there's not contamination that makes it inappropriate for a school. We say that because, and we have Durham saying that, because that is, and it's very, very, we've been guarding that jealously the whole way. If there was any reason why this site should not be a school, we would have ejected it at the immediate time at that time. So we have evidence, you know, from Nelco and from Durham saying, no, no, that's fine, you can do this and the site will be fine. And Taylor, let's tell them why that's important. There was an article written in the neighbor section less than two weeks ago, and it was a very fastly written article because we got calls that I'm on deadline and I have to have a story, and so we had to scramble and get Taylor and get Nelco and everybody to say that this site is safe. And it looked like the article was totally driven by somebody else, certainly not by us. And the school board tried to make it an issue of contamination, not an issue of funding. I think that was a, was a smoke screen or a deflection, if you will, to really take the attention off of the true issue. And they made it a big issue of um, contamination. The article said it was a contaminated site, and even though it said slightly, very slightly elevated. We've got letters from Durham, letters from Nelco Plus, a book of, and the school board said it never had any other sites, you know, never had any other sites that had issues. I've got a book of sites with issues because this is South Dade, this is a farming community, and just because a site has issues doesn't mean the site can't be cleaned up, and they recognize that. So they try to take the issue off of the real issue, which was the dollars, and they try to make it like it was this contaminated site, and that was just so far from the truth. We were very insulted by that to think that we would actually, as an EFBD, as a city, and as a community, ever consider putting children on a site that was anything but safe. And, 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 it was, and even the monitoring wells had nothing to do with the safety of children. It was about the groundwater. So, I mean, it's just, it just goes on and on and on. And it was interesting because today at the meeting, they tried to do the same thing again, and we were able to read, read this, and I'm going to read this. And this is from Nelco, and then gonna, we're going to call Nelco up. And it says, based on the February 2007 results, Durham has agreed that a monitoring-only plan will be acceptable for this site similar to the approach taken at the Naranja Lakes School site for ammonia and methane gas and North Miami Senior High School for, for I can't say that word, petroleum contamination. So we have other sites that, you know, are having schools built on that had very similar issues. So it was, you know, a bit of a smoke screen, I'm afraid. So, but I would like to hear from Eric as the chairman of the board. And let, me, let me ask you before you leave, on, in terms of the liability, who have been paying the bills for the, 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 the clearing of the land and the other? The nonprofit people? has a bank loan with Community Bank for that purpose of planning and permitting and um, clearing, and that was a million and change. So how's the loan going to be paid? By whom? Well, what? the charters. This is the. This is why. The, this is why we're here now. Thank you know goodness for the charter school. The charter school company is going to pay off. Take, to step in, acquire the site for cash. That cash is going to be used to pay. It's exactly equal to the cost basis. Okay. So basically, they're taking off the liability from the nonprofit and finishing the work. Um, sure. And we've been able. Now, let me ask the chair: Is there any legal um, impediments? Would be we have two interlocal agreements: one with the county, one with the school board. Are we not obligated? to release those funds based on the interlocal agreement. <clears throat> They're obligated to release the funds, but only to the extent that the state statute allows. And the school board is hanging their hat on statutory language saying that they will not take the site until the site is clean. So really it's sort of a stalemate between the, the school board and the EFPD and all the parties subject to the interlocal agreement. Yeah, they're, they're saying that the site has to be acceptable, which is in the interlocal, in saying that's a timing issue, and they're saying that they won't release the funds because it may never be acceptable to them. Huh. Okay. It is a true catch-22 conundrum. We've 
And it's also their interpretation of the statute. I have a statute right here for everybody that would like to take a look at it. Because it's their interpretation of the statute that they can't accept the site. Well, we have a copy of the statute. And it simply says, no K-12 school shall be built on or adjacent to a known contaminated site unless steps have been taken to ensure that children attending the school or playing on school property will not be exposed to contaminants in the air, water, or soil at, at levels that present a threat to human health or the environment. And those steps have been taken. So certainly, this is really, uh, I think the school board has really stretched this um, statute. And, and, and I don't understand quite why. And actually, Hugo brought this out today, a member of, our, um, a member of the EFBD board who is a representative from the school board. He is the one that brought this to light to say that's not really how it's read. Um, um, would you excuse me? Go ahead, Mr. Hodge. Mr. Hodge has a question for Taylor. Um, basically, what my question would be, upon the, the uh, termination of the, of the agreements and dissolving of the EFBD, um, my question would be, what would, what would happen to those impact fees that was designated to the uh, EFBD? And I understand because it never really got the first school, there's residents in, the, that's in that district are not necessarily being assessed at this time. Uh, do all of that just go away? Do that stays with the school board? But what happens is the assessments will never be collected and the impact fees will be retained by the school board as if we never had a deal. Now what they do with those impact fees um, is really up to them and that's a whole other process. We have encouraged the school board to use those funds um, for a school in Homestead. Yes, we have. We will, we suggest, we lobby as a community for that. There are, there are ways through the county to secure those funds that, that the chairman could speak to maybe. Um, there's statutory provisions that would allow for that. That is a outside the EFBD process, but all of the stakeholders in the room this afternoon know these impact fees need to stay in Homestead and the, no one used the term highway robbery, but the, the idea is at risk are the impact fees, but we don't know, through the FBD, we've done our best and we haven't gotten them, so now it's time to use a different route to grab them. Um, and there are over $6 million that are sitting that have been paid by the, the permit applicants in the EFBD boundaries on deposit at the school board that have been held in escrow because of the EFBD. Um, so maybe when Eric gets up, he could speak to these other routes to secure those that could involve the city. And Taylor, before you sit down, I, I think some of the council members have questions for you, but I would like to get everybody up to the microphone as well. So if you have questions for Taylor, Mr. Lausner. Yeah. Yes. And some of your, the prior question and the answer hit around it. As I recall, when the EFBD was formulated, I think it contemplated up to four schools. Yes, sir. Two on this 40-acre site and up to two on other sites. And in terms of debating whether or not we should join in to have the EFBD dissolved, mm -hmm. I'm thinking in terms of, you know, and it's kind of interesting because to put the EFBD together, the teachers union had to be brought on board, it had to be a public school, and now seemingly staff at school board has unraveled all the hard work that Evelyn Greer did before she was ever on the school board in bringing all of the parties together, such as the UTD, to ensure it was a public school with public school teachers in it, has, has all been unraveled. But my point was, is if the EFBD contemplated two additional schools on other sites, why not begin the process of doing those additional public schools on the other sites with the impact fees that have already been sequestered rather than dissolve the EFBD and leave those funds to the whims of the school board and the school board staff to be dispersed among a much larger area. Because we, we can't, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was going to say the, the final version of the interlocal had three the densities, when they finally got into that, you know, you set the boundaries, it was three schools. The first school would be built by the, funded by the school board. By the school board. That, without our impact fees. 
The second would be, and third would be EFBD schools with a combination of impact fees and assessments. Two of those three schools were going to be on this site. So what we've done is we've taken out of play two of the three. The third site is a seven acre site in Oasis, which is dedicated as a school. Today even we said, school board, you should immediately put your funds on that site and build a school. And, and Evelyn Greer suggested that may be an alternative as well. That is, I mean, they're fully funding the first school. Well then, this, I guess the world of the charter schools has evolved in the last two years. Whereas two years ago, we, we succumbed to the teachers union and the charter schools as an economic power couldn't do, we thought, what the standards that we wanted on the buildings. Now things have changed. This charter school can do that and has funded like $60 million in bonds. Um, so that's changed. But if they build the seats on this 40 acres to the same capacity, then we have the, the third site that the school board, we recommended they fund and build their school on that site. We're out of land and all of the capacity has been provided. So the impact fees, in our opinion, should be kept in Homestead. Where they're used, one route is to enhance the charter schools so that you have better play fields, better. That's a legal option under the new state statute, Senate Bill 3000. Um, another option is you need a high school. There, you know, that. that is a, and, and this is really, there's 67 counties in Florida, just to diverge for one second. There are over 13 or 15 or some number of counties that are struggling with this, is that the counties levy the impact fees. The cities usually collect it. The counties levy it. And more and more you've got development communities solving impacts. And the school boards still want to pull those impact fees in for other parts of the county. And it's becoming a greater growing problem. We thought we had gotten around it with this EFBD, but as it's turned out, we can't even get the impact fees. So um, that's a roundabout way of saying we think it, the problem solves itself and we, 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 don't, we don't need them for this K-8 seats directly through the EFBD. My concern is in the future, if we dissolve the EFBD now, it's going to be harder to go out and influence the return of, of those monies to this area. The EB, EFBD is still out there as a vibe, and it's a shell right now. Right, right, right. I understand that. But I'm just wondering, you're know, thinking strategically out there, even if this 40-acre site were cleaned up somehow or deemed to be acceptable by the school board in the future, that, that, that there may be some alternative there. I mean, certainly, I, is there a contemplation that this charter school would utilize the entire 40 acres? Mm -hmm. they, have a, they have a plan to do a K-12 mm -hmm. solution that would house... I was going to... I was going to... Share that. That's I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to surprise you, but we, I had a discussion. We had a meeting with um, the charter school management company and the, the company who was going to come and build the school. And I asked, "Can we not do two K through eights? Can we do a high school? Can we just do, you know, the second site be the high school?" And they said, "Absolutely." So I was very excited about that, and I was going to kind of surprise it at the end. And, and you know, I, I'd like to hear from Eric to answer your question, Steve, but we can't afford the EFBD. The EFBD was one thing and one thing only. It was a funding mechanism. That's all it was. We have, we've lost the ability to be the funding mechanism. And any, any one of the parties of the EFBD can dissolve it. The EFBD could have dissolved itself today, but uh, Chairman Fresen wanted to defer it to the city. And, you know, I mean, the, the vote was overwhelming to go ahead and, and bring this recommendation to this council tonight. But the fact is, is we don't have any money. We can't pay anybody. We have no money to pay our manager and our bond council. And, and we have, we have, it just, it can't exist. It's a funding me mechanism without funding. So it has to go away. And fi by the way, it's whole, it is actually in the way right now of getting busy and getting these schools built. Eric, did you have something to add to Mr. Lausner? And then after Mr. Lausner, Ms. Waldman would like to speak yeah. as well. Oh, well, well, well you come up, Taylor. I know that you know you came into this. You made a comment that the land was donated to the not for profit. I just want to <laughs> put my perception out there that when the former owner of that land bought that land, it was always designated as a school site. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting here thinking. You talked in terms of this new charter school paying cost basis. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting here thinking that somebody's going to create this fictional donation of 
$12 million or whatever it is worth of land, and those are some of the numbers I've heard kicked around, when that's all it was ever for, it was not programmed for residential, commercial, or anything else. And I hope that we have the ability to take part, that, that, that the money goes into the building mm -hmm. and the equipping of that charter school and not paying for land right. that was never allowed from the mid-70s to be utilized for anything but a school site. And I can tell you good news on that point. The charter school, the contract is only for third-party expenses. So the cost basis has no land value. There's Absolutely. no consideration for the land. And all <laughs> along, yeah, and we've got open books on all the expenses and the, the believe me, the charter school guys don't want to pay okay. a penny more. But that's a fair comment. And I'll, the only thing I'd say along the way is it grew. I mean, it's a bigger site than it was. And to be fair to the developer, that extra was a non-required um, contribution. But be that as it may, notwithstanding that history, the good news is it... There's no consideration. I guess that's good news. All money is going to land money. value. Yes, sir. No. Very good. Okay. Thank and you. also, yes, uh, Steve, the bottom line is, is that's a site that, uh, you're absolutely correct, but that's a site that the school board, if it were building its own school, would have had to go out and purchase that did not have to purchase. They have to give impact fee credits. That's their currency. Right, right. It's, Same as cash, really. Exactly. But the, the bottom line is, it, it was a good deal. It was a good deal. And yes, the developer absolutely, absolutely had to convey a school site. That's, that's absolutely correct. But that doesn't negate the fact that we were willing to put, you know, to, to get into action to build a school ourselves, to, to get busy and build schools. Yeah, and poor Ms. Waldman's been over there waiting. I'm waiting. just thinking. My turn? Thank you. Yes. Taylor. Mm. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, this is new to all of us so you know it's a process I know I'm sitting here with with a zillion questions and don't know where to start but mm -hmm. I, I have to go back to the beginning mm -hmm. the EFBD it's not there's been no assessment of any EFBD nothing, nothing. zero okay and you formed you said a million dollar line of credit yes on the in the nonprofit and the non a separate entity. Profit. What is the nonprofit called? The Homestead EFPD Inc. When did when exactly was that formed? Uh, at the same time, it was uh, this, um, let's see, May of '05 was the first meeting of the EFPD, and that organ that entity was created actually in '04 because it was ongoing when we were trying to get the EFPD set up. It was established in 04, 05, early 05. And did the city sign mm -mm. for liability? No, 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 no. Who, who signed for the liability? We put the land in as collateral. Okay, so the there's a mortgage on first mortgage on the site. Okay, that answers that question. Yeah. <coughs> no payments were made to any of the construction people. I mean, they're they're out there with bills in hand. The, Correct. The line of credit was used to pay engineering costs, permitting costs, planning costs, and then it was it was used to pay some of the initial costs of the site development. And then there was a period of time when the school board said, go, 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 go. And Linda was in some of these meetings. We'll release the money. We're going on good faith that we will assign this construction contract from the nonprofit to the EFBD. But we couldn't do that until the EFBD had funds. Okay, hold, hold right okay. there. Okay. Mr. Abbey, you have no bills to pay from the city? The EFB, the HEFBD has the bills, not the city. The city right. has no bills? No, the city has no bills. Okay. This is the nonprofit. Okay, so with this nonprofit, will you be able to collect, assess fees? On the homeowners, no. so that is going to be just dissolved. It completely. can only go through the, that. Can only be done with the school not being a charter school. Okay, it's kind of ironic, but um, I, under, I understand. I understand. I understand what you're saying. But my, I'm so angry at the school board. I mean, as I think we all are. But you know, I know how much taxes I pay, and I don't even have any kids in school. You know, that goes to Dade County Schools. So. 
with the impact fees not being released, you know, that's, that's a very annoying, and I'm not asking a question, I'm just venting right now. Please you know, vent, yes. You know, I mean, it's, it's just it's very annoying and it's, 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 it's quite disturbing. And you and I talked about this in 2001, and Mr. Lausner and I um, went to Broward County and mm -hmm. with you. I mean, you know, we, we, we talked about all this. But um, I, I have, I, you know, this, I, just a question. Who decides what charter school goes in there? You, you keep referring to a charter school that you've are, that sounds like you've already selected. Mm -hmm. The nonprofit was approached. Um, but do you have the right to do that? Because I was before the charter schools came to the council, yeah. so I don't know what the protocol. Well, the city is. doesn't own the, the site. In this case, you don't own the site, so they don't. It's not a city. You don't have to be burdened with selecting a charter school or even approving it. It's simply no different than a CBS coming to, to acquire the site. They have a charter. They came. They have money. But they'll have to do the traffic studies and they'll have Absolutely. to do all the things. Absolutely. To you. They've already met with it's your not, staff. They've met with our staff? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we don't know these things. I'm sorry. All right. I know. <laughs> this we, is the first we're hearing. Preliminary. Well, it's pre this is the first. It's the first meeting. Yes. It was the, today was the first time the EFBD could be presented. January 31, kind of the bomb dropped. Since then, the quorums haven't been there for the meetings because school board, well, anyway. So today was the, the meeting officially. So all of the work with your staff was on a preliminary basis to make sure that was a viable option. And maybe I should address this to both attorneys. Did I, I, did I hear you say that the city, and I know, I know Linda's on the committee, but, mm -hmm. but Kurt Ivey, what is Kurt Ivey's position on this? Oh, he's a, as a volunteer, he's a director in the nonprofit, as an individual, not a city manager. Not a city manager? No. Because I just want, I didn't, I didn't think that would be appropriate for you as a city manager to be on there, be you know, okay. so, I don't know if that's right or wrong, but I wouldn't want to, you to be on there as a city manager because of the liability towards the city. Okay. I think I'm done. Right. I don't know. This is, but I'm very angry with that. Mr. Ivey was put on as an individual so that the city would know exactly all of the... We were I so see. concerned about this piece of land, including the park and the use of the fields after hours, Absolutely. that we wanted him or some stakeholder to know. In fact, a couple of months ago, I even said, let's make the city the manager of the EFBD. We were trying to salvage the value of the structure and we said maybe the city could serve in that capacity. Well, I know years ago we talked about the city getting into the school business. Yes. And that's not what we wanted right. to do. Right. Well, that was or clear. I didn't want to do. <clears throat> Back then we didn't want to do and it. And he made it clear that you still don't want to do that. So we were we were just testing, seeing <laughs> where where this could land. Yeah. Trying Fort to salvage. Yes, ma'am. I understand. And quite Thank frankly, Ms. Wellman, that's why it's a very good thing that the land that the not for profit okay. controls the land because we don't want to be up here deciding which charter school management company that's not we should not be in the middle of anything like that and I don't want us to be in the middle of anything no. like that um, so it's 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 everything that's been done has been done decently and in order as far as the EFBD as far as documentation and minutes and everything has been done so well and decent in, or, in order with our manager and with our general counsel and with our chairman. I mean, everything has been done very much in order. Um, I'd like to hear from the others as well, Taylor. Okay. And we can replace, the nonprofit goes away as soon as the site is gone. Right. So it has a very limited life. When the charter school group takes the site, the nonprofit is dissolved. In the interim, Mr. Ivey served at, at the you know, as a favor for disclosure, but we could easily put somebody else in as a director. It was good, it was good oversight. It was okay. very good oversight. I would like to address something. Judy, Bra Judy Brostop, and I'm a director of the Homestead EFBD, Inc., and Councilwoman Walden. It's hard for me even to sit there being contained because of exactly what you're saying. The frustration has been beyond belief. And um, one of the reasons that we are in the financial mess that we're in is that the school board and uh, the EFBD have been working up until that particular time in harmony. And what they said is uh, that they would release the funds as we moved along through the phases. And in so doing, we told the contractors that as we got the funds, we would pay. 
So we started out originally with a bank loan from Community Bank, and that was sort of the seed money and the startup money because we didn't have any money. And uh, we've now used that money and have accumulated massive amount of debt, which has not been paid. And uh, we kept going because we were in, uh, we thought, harmony with the school board to reach the deadline, which was open that school. And those were all of our conversations. Those were all of our meetings. Those were all of the minutes of conversations that we had. And Mr. Um, um, city manager, in this case Kurt Ivey and myself, kept records and continue to have records, of, and so did the community bank of every single thing that was paid or everything that's been accumulated to be paid, with the basis being that the school board would release funds as we progressed. And we would continue working and they would continue releasing the funds. And then they didn't. They kept telling us next week, next week, next week. And we kept telling the contractors, we'll pay you next week. And so now a good deal of money has been um, accumulated in debt. And the contractor said, we can't work any longer. Unless we get paid, they're going to vacate the site. And all of this happened in January? In January. When they vacated the site, uh, one of the charter school operators that approached us said, what happened to your building? What happened to the progress? They knew then that we were having difficulty getting the funds from the school. And they said they would like to take over. So that's how that happened, where they approached us. And so part of the conversations that we've been having um, is that they would pay uh, for all of the billing that hasn't been paid and continue building the site, that the, the site would remain in perpetuity a school. This is all part of the agreement. And, um, and they would build a pre-K 212, you know, two, separate building, uh, two separate schools, and take care of that on the site. And uh, we still went back to the school school board and said, so what? And they said, we can't release the funds. We're not going to release the funds. Uh, they're not your funds. And um, then we started to hear from some of the contractors that if they don't get paid, they're going to start charging us interest. So to add everything onto what we already owed everybody, we now have the conversation called interest building. And the school board attorney, when we approached them, said they're not interested in any of this. They just won't release the funds. So that's where we are right now. With regard to it, it looked like a very strong possibility for us to have everybody paid, and uh, everybody meaning all the different contractors and the earthwork and the testing laboratories and everybody else, and uh, be able to continue building the school. So, if that... Can I ask one last question? Go right ahead. Um, getting rid of the EFBD... And I think Mr. Roger may have already asked this question, but getting rid of the EFBD down the road, if we ever see that new commissioners, you know, Not doing it. on the school board, you know, I mean, can we get it back again? Would it have to be a referendum, and what would we do? Well, that's a good point. Well, once it's gone, it's gone, because it takes 100 percent consent of the landowners, which were one, or actually there were 13. Now they're, you know, 900, 1,200. So once it's gone, it's gone. Um, I think the problem is it is truly, fully controlled by the school board. And when we wrote it, we didn't think of those traps or those pitfalls. We just didn't. We were naive in that the wordsmithing could be used against us like that. And I hate to sound like it's us them, but at this point it is. I think that... Eric perhaps could address there are other ways to get those impact fees which is our main reason for partnering with the school board the assessments you know everybody living in this EFBD has been told when they bought their land there would be a future assessment for schools we've racked our brains about could we save that preserve that powder if you will to help contribute towards the charter school or you know, any educational solutions in the boundaries of the EFBD. 
The problem is, again, is that is controlled by the school board ultimately as well, and they hate charter schools. So, you know, could we... Sorry. How are you going to explain this, though, to all the people that bought into those developments who were promised the EFBD schools and the developers promised that in their sales pitches? Because I've sat in those sales meetings and I've heard them say this. Well, I'll answer that. Ms. Walden, they're going to be happy because now they're going to get the schools and they're not going to be paying the assessments. They're still getting their schools. I understand they're getting that charter school. But two of them. Well, I'm talking about the 40-acre site. I understand that they're getting that. But they were promised many things. They were promised that if they lived in that boundary that they'd be guaranteed schools and their children would be guaranteed. So when you're dealing with this charter school, you know, you're going to have to make some concessions there and make sure that they know because, yes, Judy, they were promised. They were promised that if they bought in this development, they would have a taxation with the EFBD funds and that those funds would school their children. And, you know, I mean, and we're talking about... It was a tradeoff. Yes, it was a tradeoff and it was a sales pitch. And it was not that much money. I mean, really, it wasn't that much money. So many people that bought into that area, they had no problem signing off on that in order to ensure that their children would have education and good education. Right. I think that what you have is now an opportunity, as Linda said, to present a case for a full, not only K-8, but K-12 in the neighborhood, which is a benefit. That's actually, if I'm a homeowner... But that school is not going to be able to house all the new construction. I disagree. Actually, the densities, as they're finally working out, it will. It will be able to. We actually have surplus seats. It will. When you take into account a lot of the... Now, up in Oasis, Renaissance Oasis, there was a site separate that was going to house the density coming from Oasis Renaissance. They will be relieved of their assessment. There was that site, and we've been suggesting as much as we can to the school board that they build on that site. That would solve that density for Oasis. The charter school would love to build a school in Oasis and take care of it that way. We were just being ecumenical and saying to the school board, why don't you go ahead and build up there? That delivers the same number of seats without the assessments. If you will, the charter school is replacing the assessments. And the concretables at Campbell Mill, supposedly. Those are bonus, I guess, theoretically, that were coming in as well that you wouldn't have had. I don't have the statistics in front of me, but I just know that the projected build-out in that area that was in the EFBD boundaries, maybe... Thank you. Eric Fussin, the chairman of the EFBD, currently with Holland and Knight. But I'm going to provide a quick little background of how it is that I got on this board, and then I'll just start taking all the points one by one, and I'll certainly address all of Councilwoman Waldman's issues, including the impact fees and including the last question regarding student stations capacity and the boundaries for those homeowners. At the time that the EFBD legislation was being drafted, my background is in the state legislature. I was a chief of staff for the House Chairman of the Committee on Education Innovation, which is the committee that this specific EFBD legislation went through. So I had intimate knowledge of that EFBD legislation. I did staff reports on it and what have you. So fast forward three years later, I'm back in Miami. The EFBD is being formed in Homestead, and obviously there are certain appointments that need to be made. Then Chairman Bolaños has two appointments, and he asked me to serve on the board because of my knowledge with the EFBD and with education issues in general. As Taylor was mentioning with the EFBD, I guess, and the wordsmithing of it, it always contemplated the tri-party agreement mostly in part because the EFBD is mostly the function of the EFBD and its legislative intent was to be a funding mechanism for local governments 
to be able to deal directly with the impact being created by the development as opposed to having to be at the whim of what many like to call the black hole of where impact fees usually go and you're not sure exactly where they're going to be. To go with a little bit of background on impact fees, which was the entire discussion legislatively on this EFPD, Impact fees for a while in particular in Dade County have been almost assumed to be an entitlement to the school board. And to give a, a little bit of background on an impact fee, an impact fee was never intended to be an entitlement to a school district. An impact fee is simply a fee paid by a developer that was intended to mitigate the very development that's being, that's being um, paid for by that developer. It's not, it was never intended to be a fee to be paid and then the district can shell game it and use it you know, in some other section where the development isn't taking place. So the EFPD was, the concept of an EFPD was created to more, to better target those impact fee dollars and to allow a local government such as yourselves to have more control over the use of those funds. So the EFPD starts to get created here and I'll actually end this entire discussion with an ultimate irony that I think will possibly make you even more upset. But anyway, it brings us back to the point that we're at now. Um, and I'm not going to go into the into kind of more of the historical thing because I think Linda kind of wrapped up everything that's been going on with the EFPD as well as Taylor. I'll just kind of plug in a couple of holes here. Um, as, as chairman, I was appointed by, again, as, as Linda mentioned, by the school board, not by school board staff, but by the school board chair, which is the actual representation of, of the citizens of, um, of Miami-Dade County and, and their schools. And at that time, I was asked by that chair, you're not, I'm appointing you to not look at the interests of the district, the FPD, or the school board, but to build schools. So I'm entrusting you to build schools. So it wasn't a territorial thing. It was just an appointment to ensure that schools get built. So I took that as my task. And as Ms. Bell and, uh, and Taylor have mentioned, we all worked very diligently hand in hand with the school districts to get that done. The way that that agreement was drafted was that the school district, and this is very important to note, and, I, and this is one of the polls I'm going to plug in and, uh, as far as the kind of background and the timeline of this entire thing. The district, the, the way that that whole deal was structured, as as, as Vice Mayor Lawson was was explaining with uh, Ms. Greer's and everybody else's efforts, was sort of that territorial thing. We want to make sure that first school is a district school with district teachers and everything else. So, kind of the concession the school district made at that time in in exchange for ensuring that it was going to be a conventional public school. And I think that's important to say conventional public school because a charter school is a public school, so it doesn't cost anybody anything. Um, was their, their concession at the time was, well, okay, well, we'll build and completely fund that first school not using impact fees. Fantastic. That leaves all the remaining impact fees that your city in creating this EFPD could ensure that the additional student stations would be built. As Ms. Um, as Ms. Bell was mentioning, over the last six or seven months, it started becoming quite evident to me that this smoke and mirror game about, um, you know, the site and contamination and everything else was in essence, it was all about money. And I think I mentioned that in today's meeting, that as different options start coming around, um, either by the school district or by anybody else, the issue here, bottom line, was money. And to kind of dovetail off uh, Councilman Hodges' earlier discussion on the downtown thing, I started sensing that the school district wanted to get those Levi's for the Kmart budget. So they started playing this shell game with the money and the money and the budget, which is where we started making concessions as an EFPD. Well, first, we're going to build it. But then the school board said, well, we can't fund that. So they, we asked, okay, well, then how do we get a school built? And they said, well, let us do it. We'll design it, as Ms. Bell said, you know, this, we being this, the district. We'll design it. We'll get our engineers. We'll do it better. We do this. We'll do that. And then we'll fund it. Fantastic. Go do it. Um, so then they come back with a design and, you know, it's a nice design for the school, and that design, after the Panther and everything else, you know, after an 18-month delay that had nothing to do with the EPD or anything else, but as Taylor mentioned, it had to do with the Panther and Army Corps and everything else, the budgets, as all construction budgets after a year and a half to two years, went up a bit. School district then said, well, that's the school we need. Yeah, we can't reach that $45 million price tag, so you have to cover the difference with impact fees. So that's, that, that's their first foot in the door of going away, backing away from the commitment that they had of funding the first school, but then kind of saying, well, we're, we're putting in a partial $38 million. Now, you guys can't cover the seven. That's not our fault. So 
I was hesitant to agree to that $7 million or $8 million shortfall, but just, again, as Ms. Bell said, in order to keep things going, we all went to the school district in front of the board and said, we will agree to parlay impact fees from Site 2 or from the second school site over to help you build your school on this site so we can co keep continue to move forward. It's unanimous vote, school board, everybody's happy. Ms. Greer uh, made the motion, everybody's happy with that. Fast forward to January, and that's when this whole mess, kind of the 11th hour rug being pulled out from underneath us happens. Um, we get some sort of an indication from the school district um, as if they never knew, even though um, phase two environmentals had been done in the site two years ago, that there was going to be arsenic in that soil. And all of a sudden it becomes an issue about arsenic. And, and again, we, that's a response to us asking, okay, we're about six million dollars into site work on this thing. When can you start releasing funds? We don't get an answer and about two weeks later we get this now, new smoke and mirror diversion, well, there's arsenic in the soil. So, we need to have an emergency meeting, uh, Rose Diamond, everybody's in the room, and basically, they tell us, um, well, we can't take that site until all monitoring wells and all site work and all arsenic is off the floor. But we want you to continue clearing the land and putting a developable pad on that land. So I ask uh, Ms. Greer, well, um, uh, Ms. Diamond, well, we're already six million dollars over five and a half million dollars in receipts that are unpaid because you haven't released dollars yet what you're telling me is that you're definitely not going to release dollars but you want work to continue to ensure that that site is clean so that maybe when that site is clean you might release some dollars nobody on this side has any funds <sighs> frustrating i know um so that basically puts us where we're at right now. There's a follow-up meeting that Ms. Bell and Mr. Riley go to, and I think that's already been discussed at how uh, it, uh, unsuccessful that was. Um, not on their part, but just... Can I interrupt you a minute? Yes, sir. The $5.5 million? Mm -hmm. So who paid that? Who paid no, that? that's the outstanding debt that's... Well, I thought it was a million dollars. Now it's an additional... $5. No, no, no. The million dollars was the credit line that was taken out and that has been that has been paid. In addition to that, like, like Taylor said, the district said, go, 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 keep building, we're going to release the funds. So on good faith, the contractors just kept on clearing the site and kept on doing site work and kept on assuming that here's a school district saying they're going to pay for this, so we'll eventually get paid. The, the school district afterwards said, well, we're not going to release any of those funds. So that basically put us to where we're at today, and part of the reason why, as an EFBD, even though I and basically Hugo, Hugo and other members of this board voted to move forward with dissolving is because there's another option on the table that we were informed by. Um, it's a viable option. It's an option that has, that's, from my understanding, been guaranteed to have a school built on this site at no cost to the city, at no cost to the FPD, and no cost to anybody else, and it'll ensure a school. As I mentioned earlier, my task or my mission by the then school board chair was build schools, not preserve the FBD, not preserve UTD contracts or what have you, it was just build schools. So as such, seeing this as an option, that's where we moved forward. Um, to answer Councilwoman Waldman's two questions, one of them is in regards to impact fees. As Taylor said, certain um, elements of legislation have changed in the last three or four years. One of those is Senate Bill 3000, which passed in the 2005, or yes, 2005 legislative session. That was basically a response to the kind of trap that had been created, created in the wordsmithing of the EFPD. What that, what that legislation basically said was a city and or developer when building charter school stations specifically to mitigate the impact of a development can request from the body levying the impact fees, which is the county, not the school district, the county, can request for those funds to be used for that charter school. So there's an option for those impact fees to still be eventually harnessed into the city or you know to, to be used for these sites as opposed to being lost somewhere and hopefully never gained the, uh, you know and just lost somewhere else now as far as steps 
pursuing that first would kind of be putting the cart before the horse. You need to ensure that there is going to be that option of a charter school first so that you then have the leverage as a city to approach the county and say, listen, we have 40 acres. We have a charter school operator that's going to be able to build schools here. We are now coming to you as a city requesting that those impact fees be used for this. But you need that leverage of that commitment for a school to be built before you can go and pursue those impact fees. But that option statutorily is available. It's already been used. The precedent was set about six months ago in Brevard County where Odyssey Charter School, which is a school that was being built direct specifically to mitigate a development of about 1,200 homes was able to harness the impact fees created by those 12, paid by those 1,200 homes from the Brevard County Commission to help pay for portions of the construction of that school. So statutorily it's in place, the precedent has been set in Brevard County, and that mechanism is there. Um, so I would certainly advise this, this commission um, and its manager to once all the steps that are necessary to ensure that there's going to be a school built there are taken to then absolutely go out go to the county commission and say you know we as a city of homestead are requesting that these funds be used to build the schools that we that we demand as to your question regarding the boundaries and the promise that the developer made to the um, to the buyers of the of the homes or the townhouses or what have you um, as Taylor said they're actually in a better position the um, the, the statutes, the, the charter school statutes, allow for boundaries to be um, to, to be set around the charter school specifically within that portion of Senate Bill 3000 where the school is being built specifically to mitigate a development. So in essence, you can create the priority boundary of those charter school student stations that are going to be set with the identical boundaries that you had of the EFBD, which in essence means those people buying those people purchasing properties within the original EFBD boundaries will still have the preference of going to that school first and foremost and without being taxed on assessment. So in essence, they have the same promise being delivered to them. It's a guaranteed school in 08, a school that the district has already conceded they'll never build by 08, and they don't have to pay an assessment. So those those safeguards are still in place under the um, under the new option that we have. So th that that wouldn't be a concern. You as a city. Um, will have a role in the charter school to the extent that the site plan will be presented to the city and you will be voting on that site plan. So you as a city will ensure that that covenant is drafted as such that the, pre that the preferential enrollment into those charter schools will be the very boundaries or the very homeowners that were originally um, cited, cited in, the, in the EFPD. So those protections, those safeguards are there. They're there in statute, they're there in practice, and more importantly, when you as a city council approve the site plans of these schools, you can make sure that they're included in the covenant. Um, I'm not sure if there's any points that, any questions? Well, Eric, also, and you did, that was fa fabulous. You did, you did a great job. Also, we have an added bonus by, by the, the school board not performing, actually, when, when they came to us. Um, about a, a charter school company, then we were able to say we want a high school, and they were like, "Sure." Oh. So instead of getting two K through eights, we're now getting a K through twelve. So this really is a, a, a no-brainer. Yeah. It really is, and it's we tried. We we have just gone beyond the pale as far as trying and trying to, to make this work. And I, I would wonder is also if Mr. Pavalchik has anything he would like to add as he stayed here all... These people have been here all day long, by the way. We had an 11 o'clock, we had an 11 a.m. EFBD meeting, and many of them just stayed around town so they could be here tonight. So I, I, really I just have that. two quick so, questions, because oh, you right just reminded me that there was one more element um, that um, of a question that uh, Councilwoman Waldman and, and actually uh, Vice Mayor Lawsman had also kind of touched upon this point, which was the whole idea of that it was originally envisioned to have three schools, so if we dissolve the FPD, are there going to be enough student stations? Maybe, maybe not. And then will there be enough to mitigate or to house the impact that's going to be created by this development? Um, one of the kind of... Uh, one of the disappointments we had um, as far as the scope of the school was that not only did the school, not only was the school district restricting it to a K through eight, but at that K through eight started as a 2,800 student station school. Originally, originally 
2,400 state uh, student station school, and they phased that back to about a to about a 1,600 student station school. If I'm not mistaken, the um, the, the proposal that's been handed to the nonprofit for the charter school will not only be a K through 12, but there will be up to 5,000 student stations throughout the entire 39 acre site. So that's triple what the school board was committing to on the K-8 side and it'll mitigate all your grade levels K through 12. So from that perspective, um, I just wanted to touch upon that. Just to mention with the final, <laughs> the irony that I had said that I would conclude with, um, when the EFBD, and I know certainly Kurt Ivey can attest, can, can remember this, when the EFBD was first being formed in this city, um, for specifically this reason, the first thing contemplated on this site were charter schools. Right. And I actually, I'm, I'm, I'm the very charter school operator that has now approached the nonprofit to do these schools is the very same operator that was at table three and a half years ago ready to do the schools. So we've gone through this entire process with the school district, with the safeguards put in place for the UTD and for everything else to end up in the very same place that we were three years ago. And I think that's just another one of the frustrating ironies to this entire thing, but I'll certainly let Mr. Pavelch. Good evening, Mike Pavelchik. Uh, I'm with the law firm of Billing Cochran in Fort Lauderdale, 888 Southeast 3rd Avenue, Suite 301, Fort Lauderdale 33316. Um, the board today at, at passed a motion uh, suggesting and, and bringing this to your discussion. Um, and, and for that, a discussion of terminating the interlocal agreement. Um, and so I'm going to address that. I think uh, Judy and Taylor and uh, Eric and certainly Ms. Bell have uh, touched on everything else unless you all have any questions. Um, the, as you know, the, the district, the HEFBD, I'm going to call it the district, was created by ordinance of Miami-Dade County. In that ordinance, uh, the ordinance requires, and so does the uh, legislation governing EFBDs, requires that an interlocal agreement be entered into, in this case, by the city uh, of Homestead, uh, the school board, um, uh, and uh, the district is actually a party to that as well, and the county. So in the, the interlocal agreement, Section 12 provides that as long as there's no bonds outstanding, which we all know there's not, um, any party can terminate upon 10 days written notice to the other parties. That's it. So in looking at this from a legal perspective, the question came up, well, can the district, can the EFBD board move to terminate? Um, under the clear language of the agreement, it says it can. But I certainly don't think that was the legislative intent to allow by the county, the school board, and the city to appoint a bunch of individuals to a board and let them decide if they're going to terminate the interlocal agreement. To me, that doesn't make much sense. So and I think uh, Chairman Fresson recognized that, as did uh, Member Arza uh, on our board and a couple of the other members, and, and, and that's where the motion came from. So um, to do that, and I think, and Mr. White's well aware of what's going on here as well, and I think he'll agree with, with what we would uh, indicate as is the proper course of action should you choose to take the recommendation of the EFBD board. Um, that would be to send the notice required by the interlocal agreement to the other parties terminating the ILA. All that does is terminate the interlocal agreement. What remains is the district. Um, essentially the district is gone if there's no interlocal agreement. But I think what would have to happen is you would have to petition the county in accordance with your notice to rescind, I guess, rescind the ordinance or uh, dissolve the district uh, pursuant to their actions, since they are the creating entity, essentially. Um, so if you were to move forward, that would be essentially the motion would be to move to send the notice to the other parties to terminate the interlocal <coughs> agreement and um, uh, petition the county to um, uh, take its course of action to dissolve the ILA by ordinance, since it was created by ordinance. Um, 
That's really all I have to say, but if you all have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them from my standpoint. What is the, what is the position of um, Evelyn on, on this initiative? Evelyn Greer? Yeah. Oh, I can't, I can't answer that. I represent... Is she I re aware of this, and, and what, what's her position? Because she was she, very, very yeah. supportive in the creation of this EFBD, and I would certainly like to give her courtesy and notice in advance of, 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 of what this council is going to do. Um, just, just, just would be common courtesy. She, uh, she does not know about today's action. However, the instruction of the board was to send a letter to her and the school board advising them of the situation. And she does have a copy of that letter that you have from January 31. In the meeting that Ellen Greer attended with us at a staff level, and I think, Linda, you were there, in that meeting, she said, wow, you know, maybe this site is economically not feasible given the structure. She's very polite, but she said, EFPD, you need to decide is this the right site for you to build a school? That was really the extent of her concerns. Um, she kind of saw all the things on the wall and um, didn't really have a solution. Um, she supported the notion of the school board wanting to build on the site, but that's kind of e so easy. If all other conditions are met, we all would build, the school board would build a school on the site, but we can't meet all those conditions. She said that for sure. Then she said, make sure this is economically feasible so that, that that was just its own statement. And then um, beyond that meeting, we've not had any further discussion with her. So it would be appropriate if you would like, you know, for her to come and give her thoughts. I don't know how the charter issue will f play out. That's a touchy issue yeah. with the school board, but it's the only route on this site that we could find and it actually is your route mayor mm -hmm. that was preferred up front so i don't know how that will come across but i'd like to address I, mean, that. I, I don't think we have a choice mayor, right, but, yeah. to, but to move forward but i just think we just need to um just in a sense follow the protocol um, we all are because she was an effective negotiator on behalf of the city and the people of homestead working with us and making this happen and and I just think out of, um, out of courtesy to her, we need to... We will be sending her a letter. Okay. Um, we'll be sending her a letter. She could be instrumental in having these funds target to that Oasis site. But that's, that's why I don't want to um, kind of, you know, ram it in somebody's face. Because um, we'll need that kind of support as we, as we move forward. So we, we, we certainly need to uh, politically um, be very... Um, up front with her on where we're going with this issue. But, mm -hmm. um, now let, me, let me ask a question about the contamination issue. Um, you all have mentioned that we had at least two school board members on, um, sitting in these meetings for the last 18 months or two years. What, and we got Durham permission to proceed, we got clearance from Durham and um, um, What's the other environmental group? Mayor, we have NELCO testing right here with us yeah. to address this tonight. Address well, my point this. is then, if, if everybody has given us permission to proceed, what criteria, what statute did the county, the district use to say, well, the land is unacceptable? I mean, is there some, some, some there's a, there is a, there's a state statute that Ms. Bell is actually passing out to you now. That um, I think that if she's copied it from the ones I handed out at today's meeting, there's a little star there at the right um, that uh, indicates that the school, a school cannot be constructed, and it really makes perfect sense. A school cannot be constructed essentially until there's a remediation plan in, pl in place. And we think the statute is pretty clear. And Mr. Arza, a board member of the EFPD board, asked today asked their counsel, who was president and assistant, I guess in their real estate division, asked her you know, what their opinion is. How can they interpret the statute this way? And we didn't get an answer. Right. Um, but I think a clear reading of the statute is, is if there's a, a remediation plan in place, um, then the school could be built. I mean, how many, 
And I think most of the statutory references in the state law and the federal law encourage remediation and reuse of property. And especially in a case like this where the environmental issue is really more overblown than what it really is. Essentially, what I took out of the meeting that Ms. Bell referred to, which was more of a staff level meeting, was that the school board said you need to come in, if you're going to build on this site, you need to come in and you need to remove all the material and not have any remediation wells. And I think, and Nelco maybe could address it, and I'm just a lawyer, the only way you can do that is to take all the dirt 15 feet down or some arbitrary amount of down and truck it to North Georgia at the closest landfill, which I don't know if there's one closer. And that's the only way to do that without maybe groundwater wells. And Nelco, I'm probably going to say I'm wrong, but that's what I took out of the meeting was, no, you've got to take all the dirt out and replace it with clean dirt and then get Durham to sign off on it as a completely clean site and then we'll take the site. Well, I mean, that's 40 acres. That's physically impossible. And $40 million to do that. So we think that the Nelco, the work that Nelco's done and the plan that they've come up with, they've worked with Durham and that Durham's agreed to basically, you know, their plan of remediation, we kind of thought that was sufficient and that certainly satisfies the statutory requirement and haven't heard from the school board as to how that would violate that statute. We think it's more of a, it could be a staff policy, we don't know. We have not received an answer from them. Ms. Bell. And they will want you to do that without releasing any funds. Well, exactly. Ms. Bell. Mr. Babalczyk, I think we need to hear from Nelco too so we can get any questions that we need to get out in the open. I have, I just want to add, which I think will help. Go right ahead. I had a conversation with Ms. Greer about, I don't know, three or four weeks ago. It wasn't about this, it was on a different subject, it was something personal we were talking about. But we, somehow or another, a conversation came up, you know, did you hear about the land, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no. But she told me that the school board would not allow the wells because they didn't want the children being exposed to open wells. She also told me, I think it was ten feet down, that they were going to have to go. And that there was an option, and the option was not to replace all of the fill, but, and this makes no sense to me, but you take all the fill out, the contaminated fill out, and then you replace it with half the contaminated fill and half new fill. Have you ever heard of that? I haven't, but I didn't do any of the testing. That's what she told me that the school board would accept, that taking half and half. And I'm like, well, you know, why would you have that? I'd like Nelco to also address. But, I mean, I just happened to have that conversation with her. Address what a monitoring well is. Well, I'm not going to address what a monitoring well is, but I will just touch upon, going back to what I was saying, what that process that she laid out as acceptable would entail. In order to get to that point, that the site is acceptable to her and to the school district, it would be a remediation effort that would cost additional dollars. The school district is not releasing a single dollar now, little less, more dollars in the future, and the question becomes, who's going to pay for it? Well, I agree, and I know we need to make sure. And as far as the actual technical nature. I just want to have an opportunity to say I commend all of you for all of your efforts, and I know the frustration level that you must have had. So I just want to say that, and I'm done. I'm done. And welcome. Yeah, I'm VMB with Nelco Engineering, and thanks for the council. 
had to represent uh, Nelco Engineering. Uh, as uh, Mr. Mike was mentioning, this problem has like blown out out of proportion. If you take like each and every site in Homestead, based on their previous usage, every site has been used as agricultural land, and like each and every site, like including the soil and water, will be contaminated with arsenic because of all those pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers they apply. And uh, we have a resolution or like a memo from Derm that we can you know pass it to the council saying that even though like you know uh, the soil is contaminated with arsenic the only problem a derm has there shouldn't be any direct exposure as far as the soil is concerned so the, okay. this is your letter. yeah so the only the, the easiest measure according to derm put two feet of clean fill material even though the soil is contaminated just put two feet of clean fill material on top of the contaminated soil so that it's not exposed to anybody like children or like whoever you know so that's the problem with uh, with the soil and then as far as water is concerned and you know again as as i mentioned in the earlier stage it's a common problem because of all the you know previous usage so nobody is going to use the water from the ground, at least from the school side, none of the water they are going to use for sprinklers or for drinking purposes. Everything is going to be supplied by the city. So no way the children is going to get exposed uh, directly with the water. And uh, the way we got involved in the job site, there are like two things going on. One from, uh, from an environmental standpoint and the second thing is from a geotechnical standpoint. Environmental standpoint, there was some environmental standpoint. So there was this illegal dumping going on site. People are dumping all these solid waste materials. And then there's this another recommendation from geotechnical standpoint. From a construction standpoint, the each and every uh, place has to have a bearing capacity. So on this particular area, there are a lot of muck material, which is not good for a construction. So we guys were involved like in removing all those solid waste materials it was like approximately four acres of uh, materials that was not acceptable so and that's where they had a problem so once that's a source from a dumb standpoint so you can go ahead and remove those materials and uh, you, t you remove the source you remove the source of the problem and that's the end of it from an environmental standpoint from a geotechnical standpoint there's like various options you can construct a building over there like if you want to go with a regular foundation then all this muck material, the organic material needs to be removed. If you want to go on a pile foundation, it's not required. But it doesn't have anything to do to go all the way to 15 feet. Right. The only concern we had is only those four acres of land where they had those illegal dumping, those solid waste materials. And we removed those materials. Everything was done in coordination with DERM. Not even a single step was done like without their approval. And uh, there are like many sites like you know which you did an extensive file review, uh, school site, particularly school site, where the construction was on even though the site is contaminated. So DERM allows to do, go ahead and do the construction as long as you are not disturbing the existing contamination. So you can go ahead and do the construction uh, without... Uh, without like you know disturbing any water like you know without increasing the water contamination moreover the site doesn't have any discharge there's no facility or operation that's been running on site that's like keep on contaminating it's just like illegal dumping and uh, because of the natural background level you know we can prove to derm like we spoke with derm this thing nothing is going on on site for the past 30 40 years we don't know where this arsenic came from it's like just a background concentration so we got to exhibit them at least for a year like do a monitoring process and show them with the results nothing is going on site but this arsenic is just staying there we removed the source those four acres of uh, uh, land where they had a problem we removed the source but still the problem persists so it has nothing to do uh, with what's going on on site then them gives a closure on site okay you know you guys are not doing anything it's a background concentration so there's no problem nobody can do anything like you know if if you take that way like the whole homestead area is contaminated with with arsenic problem yes as well as homestead senior high i'd be curious to How big is it? as well as your backyard <laughs> Oh, I know. The monitoring well, like no, no, it's two-inch pipe. It's a two-inch pipe. Yeah, uh, I picture a well. <laughs> I have it sticks out and it's covered with a concrete uh, covering. So I have heard, I have heard such amazing speculation from school board. They, I guess, they got a, a little bit of what they had heard, 
and it just escalated. And to, to say that this is not a clean site, maybe this is not a good site, it's just baloney. I mean, this is a good site for a school. This is a good site. And if Durham says it's a good site, it's, you know, they're, they're tough. It's, we dealt with them for 18 months. Not to interrupt you. Go ahead. And there is this Naranja Lakes project, like it yes. should be there in the file view that we made. These people, they have a problem with ammonia, methane, and iron. So these things, like the methane problem, is far worse than the arsenic problem. Methane will explode once it exceeds certain level, 25% of uh, LEL. Once it exceeds that level, it's going to explode. So it's, it has like more potential problem than the arsenic problem. So uh, Miami-Dade, like county public school, they own the property and uh, you know, still there are like monitoring in the playground area and Durham agrees to construction, you know, activities. So, and this is like, there are like four or five sites where like, you know, they have the monitoring well, there is some remediation activities ongoing, and the schools are functioning on one side of the property, and uh, there's much more serious problem that's there on, you know, in many locations than this problem. Very okay. good, thank you, and I, I read that earlier, and I read sure. that this morning in the EFBD meeting, and you're absolutely right, because that it says right here that there's a, an ammonia and a methane problem at the Naranja Lake School site yeah, right so now. Th those, those file views that we did are based on Durham's correspondence. Nothing like we came, like, you know, we just uh, made up something or assumption. All these, uh, you know, the uh, data that I gave you are from Durham records. So Durham knows and the file is for a public review. So anybody can get all of these files, have a look at them. That's the case going on. Yeah. Mr. Mayor. One, yeah, yeah. Question. Go, go ahead. Quick one. What the school board also said about the contamination was there was they're insisting that there was ammonia, and all I'm hearing is arsenic. But there was a, there is ammonia uh, and methane uh, found on the site, and that's what they're saying to defend their their pollution uh, argument. Is uh, there uh, so or okay. was that removed? Uh, what happened is like initially a derm had an, uh, like. Five monitoring was in the whole site, as I mentioned to you, the four acres of uh, uh, area that they had the problem, there was five monitoring wells in total. And those wells came out with ammonia and arsenic and methane. So once you remove the source, once you remove, like the solid waste is a source of creating ammonia and methane, once you remove the source which has been already done, which has been documented, like, you know, with all the manifest, everything, so there's no more issue with ammonia and methane. <coughs> if there is no source, there's no methane. Uh, I wanted that for the record, because if you have a, a, a subsequent uh, conversation, that's what they were saying. So, really, it's arsenic. Like, everything else we deal with in our land development down here is what we're dealing with. Mike. One, two, three. <laughs> Mayor Council, of course, uh, board standards are, you could really have parks, you could have you can have similar locations like this. Frank speaking, I don't know what the standards of the school board are, but uh, Hey, without adding too much to the discussion, it's really just the problem. Mayor, can I ask one question of Jen? We, we talked about Senate Bill 3000 and, um, and going to the County Commission for retrieval of those impact fees or retrieval of money to go back into the district. Is that a full County Commission vote or would that be something that a, a manager in a strong mayor form could work? Do you have any idea? I'm not exactly sure. We'd have to look into it. Um, I, I don't know if you... County Commission vote. Full County Commission Full vote. County. Okay. That makes it more difficult. Yes, indeed. Sorry. But, you know, in the scheme of things, if, you know, to simplify this, oh, we can go get it back from the County Commission. County Commission is a challenge. <laughs> like the school board. Thank you, Mayor. Absolutely. So, uh, Ms. Bell, any other presentation? We need to wrap this up. And, we uh, do need to wrap okay. this up. So what's what I'd like to do is go ahead and move it and um, read the motion for, for um, to be seconded. And the motion is to terminate the interlocal agreement and request the county commission to dissolve the EFBD. And the motion's on the floor. Subject to review by the city attorney. This came from the city attorney. Oh, okay. <laughs>
What we what we would do is we would formalize it at your next council meeting in a resolution, and and you would you would memorialize that in a resolution. Okay. I'll second, and and we'll send it. In the meantime, we'll send that forward to Evelyn Greer okay. for her. Moved by um, Councilwoman Bell, second by Councilman Porter. Any further discussion? Roll call on this one, Madam Clerk. Vice Mayor Rosner? Yes. Councilwoman Bell? Yes. Councilman Hodge? Yes. Councilwoman Garner? Yes. Councilman Porter? Yes. Councilwoman Waldman? Yes. Mayor Warren? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you all very much for your hard work and You're welcome. let's move forward for the school. Let's get the school built. We're not leaving the effort, just so you know. So we'll good. be back with the site plan. Very good. Okay. Thank you very good. much. Thank you time. all very much. All right, Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. I had no idea we'd still be here at 8 o'clock on a Tuesday night. I miss, I miss my case for that. <laughs> you may recall that over a course of several presentations of the preliminary drawings, both elevations, floor plans, uh, configuration on, on the site, uh, our architects took comment not only from council members, but <coughs> but from the public. And one of the major issues that came to the forefront was the question of adequate parking, whether or not it was appropriate and proper to, uh, to count the recently completed CRA parking lot on Washington and, and uh, first to, to count toward parking spaces at, uh, at City Hall. Uh, took a second look at that and some of the other issues and uh, primarily the, the architects are here tonight and I want to thank them for hanging in there. It's been a long afternoon and stretching into an evening now to talk with us about some of the reconfigurations of, of, of the parking lots and, and location of some of those additional parking spaces primarily as well as some of the other tweaking that has taken place and, and a, uh, a more concrete time schedule for, for moving forward. So with that uh, Council, we'll, I'll get out from the front of the screen and we'll uh, move forward with that. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we certainly welcome Javier's uh, contributions to the team. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members, um, thank you for inviting us uh, back. We, this is our fourth uh, phase uh, since we first started with the uh, site uh, selection phase. We went into programming, you might recall, and then schematic design. Go ahead. Um, I'll take you very quickly through these uh, for the benefit of those who are in the audience today may not have seen it before. This is a city hall site uh, bounded by Washington and Civic Court and part of the uh, site development will be to close uh, Parkway. Go ahead. These are the boundaries of the historic district. Go ahead. This is the uh, planned alternate route for trucks. Go ahead. And then critical, as Vice Mayor Lozner said, to, to this effort is, uh, as always, for any project in Miami-Dade County, is parking. And we had identified these um, lots that are parallel to the busway as potential uh, sites for parking, and uh, they are of the 
desired width to be able to have the most efficient uh, parking layouts. Okay. Okay. If you can focus on this, because this is uh, this is new. Again, this is Washington, and this is Civic Court, and this is the city hall, this is the council chambers. Uh, we have this existing parking lot that was developed by the CRA. We're calling this the Washington Avenue site. And we have now 82 parking spaces there. What we had contemplated at one time was to realign it and, and um, unite it with the balance of the parking that we are showing on um, site one, which is a city hall site. and. That would add another 92. Like they say in the NFL, upon further review, we, we decided that if we did not have to, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, Raul. And if we can live with this the way it is with access from the one point in Washington, uh, because of the funding that was utilized, maybe we're better off doing that. And then the city can enforce whatever parking uh, rules they want. but more likely this might be the lot for the use of those who ride on the busway. Now, uh, the parking uh, ordinance, of course, is one that derives from the size of City Hall. And if you take the square footage, the raw square footage, what you really need is roughly 267 parking spaces. So what we thought we would do is leave these 92 on, on site where they are accessible from Civic Court and then from Flagler Avenue on, just on the other side of the busway we could provide the balance of 175. As you see the site is much larger and it's city owned but we thought that we would only uh, pave light and landscape that which was needed for City Hall. I might add that although that's not uh, contemplated under this project should you ever want to solicit a developer and this has happened in other cities uh, in Miami-Dade County where we have worked all that the developer would have to do of course is to provide the parking uh, in a parking garage if uh, the developer so chose in order to be able to use the ground level which sometimes is more valuable uh, for retail and other functions but the fact is that with a minimal investment now of uh, you can go ahead and, and pave light and landscape that site and provide all the parking that you need under this project. Go ahead. Okay, these are the updated plans. Very, very simply, you remember there's a council chamber and there's an office building, a very efficient office building, and there's a grand hall in the center through which you access both. Uh, the uh, fitness center, you might recall, has its own entrance from the uh, uh, fountain court. Uh, you then have from the Grand Hall those departments that are most v heavily uh, visited and here we have the Development Services Department and you have the Office of the City Clerk and you have HR. So those are the three departments. Everybody wanted to be on the ground level like all rooms in a house want to be near the kitchen, but these are the three that um, were deemed to be the most important uh, in the office sector site. Uh, I should say that a couple of the refinements that are already appearing in design development are the correct sizing of all the services. So you see them all in gray. This, these are the uh, required uh, for convenience really, but required uh, lockers for the uh, fitness center. And what we also have here are the compliance with the accessibility requirements. The finished floor of the ground floor of City Hall needs to be at this height uh, for very good reason, flood criteria. So we have steps for those who can negotiate the steps and, and then ramps uh, everywhere we have the steps. It's an option here and here. Go ahead. Then on the next floor, we might recall that the middle of the middle continues to be the emergency operations center, which is a small part of the general services uh, department. You have finance here in green. There's some finance records, storage here in a small conference room. And then in the blue, you have the CRA here. You might recall that this is also the floor where you have access to your terrace that faces Fountain Court and all of these are function rooms and food prep areas so that you can uh, bring in a caterer and serve from there and in the normal 
day events. It can be like uh, a lounge to serve the rest of the population. Okay. And then this is the third floor, which you might recall has always been divided between the mayor and the city manager staff, mayor and council uh, members, I should say, and the city hall staff. There's a little bit of unassigned area, which I uh, suspect will be assigned before the building is built. But uh, anyway, the, uh, there, there are two conference rooms as well that are shaded gray because we are including them as building services, but that would be available to be booked. Um, again, um, by any and all departments. The uh, go ahead. This is a little bit more of a detail of the of the cross section. Here you see the grand hall. This is the council chambers. All of these dimensions have been adjusted as the prime develops. These are again the stairways. Uh, we have a mechanical room on the roof, which is concealed by the metal roof, and we have here the two-story terrace out onto Fountain Court, and this room here is the uh, uh, fitness room. Okay. So this is again that was a cross section. This is the elevation uh, as as it stands today. You see the negotiating of the ramps here and there and the steps already showing the correct uh, elevation. Go ahead. Remember the sketch so we're still consistent with what we showed you. Go ahead. This is the cross section. You can see this from Fountain Court. If you had x-ray vision, this is what you would see. You see again the emergency center being the middle of the middle. Go ahead. And then this is the elevation from Fountain Court, and here you see the arcade that will be placed along Washington Avenue. Go ahead. Again, this is still consistent with the sketches that we showed you at the end of schematics with the Fountain Court, the entrance to both the deliveries and the uh, fitness center, and the terrace overlooking Fountain Court. Go ahead. Go ahead. These are the same uh, renderings of the Grand Hall. We're now in the uh, selection of finishes, which we will be bringing to you all so that you can see the actual materials that are being contemplated. Go ahead. Again, sections through the council chamber. We're now beginning to engage the, uh, the services of an acoustical consultant as well to not only do the room acoustics, but also do the sound systems and and the uh, sound isolation which is required in this room go ahead go ahead okay here's where we are march 30th we completed the 100 percent design development phase plans went out to our independent cost estimator and by april 18th we will have the uh, most current uh, Statement of probable construction cost. This has the benefit now that there are engineering drawings included in this 100% uh, design development phase. Between March 30th and October 31, there's approximately seven uh, months, and we will be back if you so desire somewhere uh, around 4th of July for a 50% uh, presentation of contract documents. This becomes again a more technical phase but still I think you might want to get a report on what's happening in terms of the development, further development certainly of the, uh, of the, uh, of, of the uh, uh, council chambers. The um, gap here between October 31 and January 2nd we're using to be able to permit and price uh, this uh, building. Right now, in conversations with staff, we're uh, going the route of a hard bid, low bid situation. I would not have recommended that a year ago, but with what's happening in the construction industry as these uh, condos are being finished, uh, the uh, airport work is also uh, nearing completion, I think you might have a window of opportunity uh, and be able to get a better price if you hard bid, low bid. My concern a year ago might have been or was that we might not have had any interest uh, in the, uh, the it cost money to bid for contracts, but we hope that uh, by the time uh, we, we come to October 31, the market will frankly be a better market for you all. Now what that does is you start construction um, first, you know, January 2nd, and you have 18 months, and by July 2009 you should be able uh, to, unless we find something like the school board running the project, I think we should be able to, uh, to complete this in time by July 2009. <laughs> 
if there is any questions, I'll be happy to entertain them, and, and I thank you for the opportunity again. Questions or comments from council and then from the public? Yeah, Mr. Hodge? Thanks, sir. Um, um, I, I did uh, mention uh, in before, uh, by the way, it is a beautiful drawing and a, and a beautiful building. Thank you, Reverend. Um, but I did foresight. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's going to be effective in, in the cost. Or what have you, but I, I also looked at. I know it's a government building, uh, but I also envisioned that the building not just be, uh, you know, government, but be a fully fully functional building. Um, uh, personally, you know, I would like to see at least you know two more uh, floors uh, in the building, and and that will allow for the the city to uh, put it under management for you know lease lease space or office space. Uh, because you, if we look at it, we're going to be constructing. Uh, there will be no uh, tax dollars uh, uh, coming in for that particular uh, piece of property. Uh, that would uh, uh, give some form of income um, to the city for that lease space. Also, uh, looking at it in a, in a futuristic aspect, and, and I noticed basically what we're doing, we're taking all the, the different uh, departments of the city and, and housing it in one place. There is some uh, additional space uh, for, for, for growth, but uh, that additional space to me is very limited if we have to become a, a, bigger, a bigger city. Um, also, you know, just, in, just taking an aspect of what's going on with our, our tax issues that, that we're, we're facing, and we may not know what, what, the, what may happen in, down the road, um, I mean, the city may have to take over some departments that the state and, and the county uh, currently uh, provides or, or services, uh, and we will need that additional space for um, the uh, for those departments. So I guess my my concern uh, would be if we're gonna if we're gonna build a building, make sure we build a building uh, that you know. 10, 20 years down the road, we're saying, okay, now we got to build a bigger building because now we're out of space again. And, you know, I, I would say build it now or at least construct the building in a, in a way that if we needed that extra floor space, then it could be built on, on top of it. Or you, you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Um, and that's kind of the, my aspect of, of looking at the building. I think that... Um, there, at least another floor, uh, minimally, but you know, preferably to 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 have the space available, square footage available for for city growth in in the future. Um, I, I see the city growing. I don't see it getting, getting any smaller. So, uh, and I do think there will be um, additional departments that we're going to have to take on at some point in the future, and we're going to need the space for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you would comment on, on what we've already built in right. above and beyond what we have now, and I you know, just want to comment that although you know on the color codes it indicates I think space certain spaces are allocated to certain departments, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be utilized fully at this point. Right. The the, the programming exercise that we went through uh, asked each department head for uh, current conditions, which were, I don't need to tell you, deplorable, and then two projections, you know. So we, um, we, we took that into account. Now, you know, the future uh, growth of the city is something that obviously we can't predict. Uh, you'll never hear an, an architect argue against a bigger building. <laughs> they always like that. The the strategy that I do want to say to you that would would not be practical would be vertical 
expansion after you've topped it off because it's the most disruptive, the most expensive. Uh, it, it brings you uh, leaks. Uh, you know, it, it's just not something that to be done. You also have to bury the money in the foundations, which you know not if you're going to eventually use. I think that one strategy might be to to develop a master plan which might include another office uh, bar building you won't be replicating obviously there's only need for one uh, commission chamber council chambers and again the, the I don't want to be so bold as to suggest but there are a couple of, uh, of natural sites and one of them is the, the flagler site where we're doing the parking on grade the developer may be the city uh, you may be parking on grade now as, as you know, uh, you own the property already as a modest investment and then and if, if it so warrants you can come back and build over that parking and allow the parking to go on a, on a deck. That, that would be one kind of easy suggestion. It's next to transit and it's across the street from the busway and it would make a lot of sense if, if you want to um, somehow uh, 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 offer the city up for development, for you know, private sector development. You might ask for in return of for the for the property to have them build you X number of square feet, and then you can do as you want. But I can tell you from my own experience that construction costs being what they are, and you have the benefit that you that you own the land. But um, there's very little in terms of uh, leasable office buildings being built in Miami-Dade County now. And even though they're done with the uh, residential condos uh, and there is no established market for office condos, uh, one is beginning now. I mean, people are starting to turn to office condos because it's just, you know, people will not build an office building on a spec. It's just the rents are not there yet. You know, people are not willing to pay thirty-five, forty-dollar rents. So, what, what, what the market, you know, supply and demand, what the market is turning to is okay. Uh, you're an architect. You have a firm. You'll get a bank to loan you money uh, because it's owner occupied and there's no risk relative. And then you can go and buy your own unit inside of a condo. I'm not comfortable with it, but I'm going to have to probably do it. But. You know, I just wanted to answer in, in, in order. Bigger building, you won't hear a complaint from the architect. But if you do cap it at, at three stories like it is, I, I can't promise you it will be uh, economically feasible to, to uh, expand it vertically. But luckily you do have a critical amount of land surrounding uh, the city hall that you could, again, come back and do a straight office building to, if, if you so desire. Yeah, because basically what my what my uh, concern would be, because the idea was to house all the develop the, the departments in, in one place, so they're more easily uh, accessible by each department, as well as um, being able to function more efficiently. So you know, I feel <clears throat> I feel that um, you know it should we should allow additional com accommodations uh, for that, obviously. Uh, and, and for uh, the reasons uh, previous stated, and, um, and I, I really understand your point on, on you know having the you know the market for the condos. But as I recall, we we talked about being able to bring uh, you know court ser court services and, oh, yeah. and those type and those type of additional services that our citizens have to drive north for uh, to be able to house house them here. In, in Homestead, and to me, it's the perfect opportunity to be able to uh, do such do such services and, and have the space uh, for that. Um, and it, to me, it just makes sense if you know we're going to do it and, and expend the monies to to uh, you know be able to provide the, the, the services necessary and 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 look look really beyond the the box. Of just housing our our particular department, but look at the additional services that's going to be needed in in our community and providing the space for that and an additional in the event that you know we might end up moving Durham to Homestead. <laughs> you know, you never know. Uh, but but if that if that happens, where where are we going to put them? Um, you know, with 
all the things that, that's going on in the county and the housing industry, and, and we're pro trying to provide affordable housing, we may end up with a, a housing department, you know, where we're going to put them. So, you know, and that's the way that I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm thinking where we're going to put them today. If we're going to build, let's, let's, let's think about that today instead of waiting until that time comes and, and then think about where, where we're going to put them, you know. And, and to, to go back and say, okay, well, we got space over here, let's build the building over, over there, then we're just, we're repeating, we're repeating history. That's where we are now. Mm -hmm. and, and my thing would be to, you know, if we're going to fix a problem, let's fix a problem now. We always complain about uh, the transportation issues where, you know, they go out, they figure out how many spaces they need on, on a road, and by the time they, they plan it, construct it, it's time to do it all over again because it's, it's kind of, you know, it's out of date. Right. So my thing is, you know, let's, let's do it. Let's think ahead now and, 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 do, it, and do it right. Thank you. Thank you. Any further for counsel? Beautiful. It, it is. Thank you. And, uh, I would foresee that potentially our ability to produce revenue would be along that that ground level that we have there along the the Flagler uh, corridor. Mm -hmm. um, as we sit here tonight, I'm comfortable that the 60,000 square feet that is proposed is sufficient to take this city far into the future. I kind of approach this with the mindset that we're almost built out. And what the building and zoning and planning departments need today are probably far more than what they will need in the future. And that spaces will be swapped out. And we may very well have a housing department that may utilize space that's no longer needed needed from building and zoning and you know clearly things change i mean we're looking here biting our nails over over the tax overhaul issues but i think as as we sit here today i'm i'm comfortable with the needs assessments that have been done now if the building on the east side hadn't happened you're probably right on on the point you know i think there are two issues there do we want to install a a, a revenue stream into that building on one hand and, and have we built enough for the other um, I guess my my mindset was and that's you know we, we've taught we had that conversation um, for security and aesthetics and a lot of other reasons I don't know that we necessarily want to mix those uses and as I said I'm, I'm pretty comfortable that as as the focus has changed within the city there is sufficient space to to do that and I think you know, to put it in perspective I think Mr. Shahana or maybe Mr. Chandra shared with me one time that the Chamber Center next door here is 15,000 square feet. Is that right, Mike? Do you remember that? The three-story building next door is 15,000 square feet. That's, and that building to us and by Homestead standards is huge. <laughs> but it's a fourth of a 60,000 square it's foot City right. Hall building. It's all right. Yeah. This is another one, maybe. Like <clears throat> Just to put that in perspective, that's quite a building next door in the city hall site would be four times that that size. That's that's pretty significant. Any comments from the public? Ms. Waterman Powell. Good evening, Clara Waterman Powell, twenty two seventy four Southeast Twenty Seventh Drive. I always have this policy: let them do their job, and and uh, things are been tweaked nicely. I saw some comments. I love it. I can't wait till I can say I live in Homestead and this is my city hall. Mm. I am just going to be so proud of it. It's something that I would love to see. My husband and I spent a lot of time in the chamber quarters and I really would hope you would readdress the alignment of the seats because I'm going to get a crooked neck. Now, <laughs> it's probably a new point because <laughs> There are not very many of us who come, but I can see some of the people sitting on the side throughout the meeting like this. 
Now maybe we could alternate every half hour walking from one side to the other so our neck doesn't get out crook. But I really think that when you do readdress the chamber quarters, that you look at how the public is going to be sitting, trying to see the looks on the chamber faces. I was very pleased to see that you, you made it s circular. I don't use any of the other uh, services of, of the city hall, but this is my service where I see the public. So I'm looking forward to seeing that tweaked a little bit more, maybe fewer seats. <laughs> and also, I'm interested in knowing where staff is going to sit. If the staff is going to be sitting on the side staring like this, that's fine. I only saw a few seats in front, and staff usually fills up half the chamber quarters. So I'm looking forward to seeing that tweak more, but I can't wait to say I live in Homestead and this is my city hall. Thank, Thank you, you very Thank much. Thank you very much, and I want you to know that the um, design of the council chambers is a, a critical, um, I mean, critical uh, Portion. The, the easy part, frankly, is the, is the office building. And as I mentioned to you, we're going to bring on consultants, and the semi-circular uh, arrangement is that which has, you know, been proven true from the U.S. Senate to the French Assembly to, but still, that doesn't mean that uh, we, we can just rely on the precedents. This is the one that needs to work. So uh, we, we have someone who specializes in this. And um, you will be, see, this is one of the things that even though they might appear too technical, when, when we come to the contract document stage, you might want to see. Uh, I mentioned that. I think the office building is pretty much, you know, the fait accompli. It can get bigger or smaller, and, or it can be tweaked in, in you know, just like a tenant office building, this tenant moves out, this other tenant moves in. If you don't need to do the tenant improvements, again, you don't, but if you do, it's not a big deal. But the chamber is the one customized space that really needs to be uh, right and right for a long time. Thank you. Uh, Ed Powell, 2274 Southeast 27th Drive. Um, last, the last uh, the meeting we had where you had... Schematic design, right. Yeah, you had just discussed... Uh, the, the city hall we talked about mechanical and I'd mentioned my background and I'd asked about looking at my two cents I don't know if there's any mechanical engineers in the city uh, maybe the staff are experts but we all know that certain engineers and architects have certain little things they like to put in because it's easy because they do that all the time and a lot of times you I, I found engineers who had pet designs because they did them all the time and sometimes that wasn't the best interest of their client but that's what they did and that's what they got so I'm what I am asking again is possibly to be add my two cents to the process of hopefully looking at your mechanical and looking at the system and make sure I can explain to myself and possibly to you if you're interested in what that's going to be uh, it's it's got to be a long term. It's not a little residential sticking a bunch of little units outside, and they'll run for ten years and we'll replace them. We have a building here that's going to last a hundred years, and we should we should be looking at systems that go along with that. So well, I, I am again off asking. Can I add my two cents and get a, get a look at the mechanical specs and the design? Um, thank you. Yeah. All right. Yeah, the, yeah, the quick thing is, the question was asked, is total square footage and then square footage less the council rotunda? Do you, do you have that? It's roughly 60,000 square feet of offices. 50,000? 60, 60,000, roughly. Thank yeah, you. This is but we are hiring a uh, 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 
and the reason we ability review so like it there it's going to be part building and looking at the green building issues as well some of the city On the mechanical issue, uh, at the end of schematic design, as you know, we didn't have any engineering. Now we have engineering for you to review, and it was sent, it was submitted on the 30th of March, so it's open. I mean, it's up to you all. It's your building. But we certainly don't have a problem, and like Mike said, there's another firm that's doing peer review, which we welcome, which is not something unusual uh, for any public building. You have the design architects and engineers, and then you have a peer review process. So. Sometimes in house you have longer issue. Um, there, there are some firms, and we respect them, that choose to have architecture and engineering all under one roof. I practiced with one such firm for ten and a half years, and I swore that I would never have engineers under my roof. And it's very simple. They want to be on their own. The best ones want to be on their own. I could never have an acoustical engineer of the quality that I can go and pay only when I need no, I am being nice. you with a blunt instrument. No, no, but that's why I'm being nice. Do you know any engineer who would like to work for an architect? You know, I don't think so. I mean, so, what, what, you know, the, the point is, the point is, it's not a matter of lack of expertise. We have a, a very reputable engineering firm called Amtech doing electrical, mechanical, and plumbing. But again, this is the first time that their work is available for review. All that they had as part of the schematic design phase was a brief describing what the systems were going to be like. But now there are drawings that you can review. Thank you, Ms. Walden? No, I just want to say real quick, don't forget my little bicycle things. No, 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 no. Because <laughs> I'm hoping, you know, like, like Vice Mayor said, you know, the green aspect, and as we get, as we see fuel go up and up and up, and the trailway um, coming in with the busway, and I'm, I'm hoping that we can encourage visitors to stop on their way as they're riding the trail and visit our city hall. So I, I can tell you already that nothing that the architect has done, well, we only recommended the site, but something that you did, you get green points just because you're near a mass transit uh, site. So right there, you, you know, so we, we are going to be uh, calculating these points for you so that you know the level of green design that, that... And in the fitness room, will there be shower facilities? Right. I pointed those out in the plan. They're across the hall. Yes. I must have been getting my tea. No, no, no. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's an abstraction. Thank you. No problem. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you all. And, you know, once again, these outlandish statements have surfaced in, in the press again, and I'm sure they'll be out there on the blog later tonight if they're not already there. And we'll have the discussion again about, uh, you know, the failure to build a new city hall has nothing to do with cutting the millage rate or giving this, this community a $20 million break in taxes. They're mutually exclusive issues. And we'll again have that discussion tonight was to, to address that. But, you know, I, I thought we were beyond that and uh, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a different way. We're beyond it. And I want to thank all you all. And, you know, we, we give an ample opportunity for people to come. And, look, we have a healthy respect for reasonable difference of opinion. And we can all respect that. But I would hope that as this moves forward that, uh, you know, the hype would fade away and the facts would remain at the forefront. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Good job. Thank you, Thank you gentlemen. Thank you. Item 2D is the City Homestead Speedway Water Tower Amendment to Sprint Lease Agreement and Resolution. Move Move second. Moved by Mr. Porter, second by Mr. Hodge. Any questions on it? Question of the manager. 
Mr. Ms. Weissmuller? Yeah. Are we comfortable with the business aspect of this? I mean, I'm still seeing and hearing about some of these other cell phone tower leases that are just outrageously high. Are, are we comfortable that this is, this is in the ballpark? We are. Uh, these things are uh, really actually we work with our telecommunications attorneys as well in uh, negotiating these prices. And, uh, okay. This adds another 4,800. Uh, we right now, I think, make right at 100,000 off of these rentals a year. Uh, not counting this one, by the way, it'll be about 100. Pretty healthy. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Any other questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item 2E is the write-off of the Redmond Hotel, Inc. revolving loan fund. Mr. Mayor and Council, basically this is somewhat of a housekeeping uh, act, act, action uh, being taken. Uh, this loan was made and then it was uh, renewed. There was a note renewal in 01. And uh, uh, since that uh, point, there's, uh, I guess, the last payment was made in uh, August 29th, 2002. I mean, we've had conversations with the Olsons on this. They're, they're unable to pay. We do have uh, the second mortgage on this, and, and uh, Mrs. Wallman, uh, Councilman Wallman, uh, had in, uh, inquired about that with me today. Uh, so, so that getting this off the books is not like saying we're not going to collect. What it does is this is administratively, we don't have it up there as a non-pay sitting there with the pays. This has gone far enough at this point we're not collecting, but we have a second mortgage. If they sell it, they have to clear the title. That means they have to satisfy the mortgage if they have the money to do so. We could, we have the option of uh, foreclosing because they haven't paid us. But we would pay the cost of the foreclosure, at which another entity would probably get all the money. I'm asking so a question. It really, at this time, strategically, doesn't pay for us to, you know, make a foreclosure to push for payment of, uh, of this of, uh, money. Now, remember, and I, you know, I got to say this carefully, but I don't because I don't want to sound uh, uh, not a good shepherd of, of, of money. This is not tax uh, the local taxpayer money in the sense this was a, a grant uh, in the RLF fund so this is not our ad valorem issue and that's become a sensitive issue now so I wanted to, to make that clear but I'm not belittling the fact that somewhere down the line it's taxpayer money because it came from the federal government but as far as ad valorem taxes uh, at the city level it didn't come out of our general fund or, or that kind of thing so, Ms. Ms. Redden? <clears throat> Would this payoff at time of sale, because we all know that this property is for sale and right. has been for sale, right. they have a sign actively in front of their property. Um, would this uh, incur interest? In other words, is this, is this the loan amount or are you going to be charging interest? And, and well, we'll answer that. Yeah, that answer. <laughs> I wish I thought the building was going to sell for enough to pay off all of TIB Bank and all of our loan and all of the interest that is owed now and may accrue to some time in the future. I don't have any confidence this is going to do that. So, yes, if there's enough money there, we'll charge the interest. But I don't know that there's going to be enough money there when it sells to do it anyway. <clears throat> well, my only problem with this, Mr. I guess I'm just addressing both of you, um, managers, um, is that we may be sending a message that you know, hey, I've got I've got some collateral and I've got I've got a, a property. I think there's six. I didn't bring my, my research with me. I ran out of the house really quickly tonight. But I believe there's six active loans. Is that correct? Uh, two, four, six. Yes, ma'am. There's six active loans, and, you know, I don't know if collateral is behind each one of those loans. I don't know if there's, if, if there's um, kick the bricks property behind each one of those loans. I don't think so. <coughs> but those that do, and I'm not going to mention the names, but those that do have um, property, and, and let's say we do fall on hard times, and they say, oh, no problem, I'll just stop making the payments. And uh, all five, uh, excuse me, all six loans, with the exception of the one we're speaking of now, the subject loan, which has not made a payment since 2002, 
and I believe there's a one that hasn't made a payment since December. But I know, I believe that you're charging interest to those people. And I just, you know, I just, I don't want to set a precedent. And I know we're not, we're probably no longer going to even have, you know, any more loans going out. But we still have active loans. And I'm just very concerned. And my question is, why can't we just, you know, why, why can't we, why do we have to do anything? You know, it's been setting on the books. You know, I just don't want to set a precedent. Well, I think that's my issue. People have criticized the city for having things on the books that haven't been paid. And that's the way that, you know, they look at it. As long as we're incurring the interest, you know, and at the end of the day, I mean, the fines or whatever, attorney fees or whatever, that should be on all loans. And I don't have anything against anybody. I'm just saying, technically, you know, I just believe everybody should be treated exactly the same way. And I know we just recently had an issue with an outstanding loan. And I'm not going to mention that name. And there was a lot of pressure put on that person and a lot of press about that person. And, you know, I just want to make sure, and I can't remember who it is that's in arrears from December, but I'm sure letters have been sent out. I'm sure that, has it been turned over to the attorney? No, the gentleman there had a heart attack. And we're working with him and his family trying to get it caught up. Well, I just, you know, I just don't want to set a precedent. Well, I think what Judy is saying, too, is do we have a write-off policy? Because I think we need to have a policy that said at a given date and time and after continuous due diligence, you meet this threshold and we recommend that it's written off. So I really would ask the staff to go back and really look at a policy to deal with the write-offs such as this so that it's consistent, it's fair across the board, and when anyone meets the threshold or meets the criteria, you all come forward to the council with a recommendation. But I agree with Judy. I just think that until I see that policy, I don't think we should move forward on this write-off. That's fine. We can come back to you with a policy. I agree. Thank you. And I agree with that. And I think that as far as a housekeeping issue, it needs to be made very clear that upon sale that the city would recoup its dollars. And we need to make that very clear to the community because this is a very large sum. And so that we need, and I really think that in the future, I don't even know if we're doing these loans anymore, but I think in the future if we were to, that we should take collateral. If it's a loan on a business or whatever, they need to be willing to put some of their, whether it's their house up or whatever, because if we're going to put these dollars on the line, then we need to make sure that we get reimbursed. This is a lot. And, again, this is nothing against the owners either. I think they've done a really tried very, very hard to make this place work. But I want to make sure the community understands that upon sale, of course I'm sure Tib is first and we're second, according to what I've read, that we will recoup these dollars. So, because in the reading I did say that it was housekeeping, but I do share the same concerns. I really do. And one final piggyback. Is Tib current? No. Is Tib going to foreclose? They're trying to avoid it. Sorry. Getting over a terrible cold. Well, when you say they're trying to avoid it, how far back are they with Tib? The last time I checked, they were about six or eight months in arrear. I haven't checked recently. If we were a bank, we would have already been required by the FDIC to write the loan off, because as far as an asset on our books, it has no value since it's non-performing. Now, just like a bank will have to write off a non-performing loan, doesn't mean they're never going to collect it, doesn't mean the customer doesn't have to pay it, and doesn't mean the customer is not eventually going to have to pay interest on it. What it means to the bank is that the FDIC doesn't want them to show it as an asset. Well, let's just put it like this. I hope, 
and pray that Chubb doesn't foreclose. Because I know that they're, they're adding up the interest and the fines and penalties. You know, if there are any, many lending institutions would do that. And in order for us to ever see our $190,000, we would have to um, come in and, and put up some money there. So, um, we don't want them to foreclose. Exactly. You know, we'd have to buy them out. So, you know, we definitely don't want to see that happen. So I would just suggest that we, that we form a liaison with the bank and make sure that they know, <coughs> you know, that we are hopefully <laughs> in partnership with them and, 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 they hope, do. and hope that the, sell, the property sells quickly. They, they do. Now, these funds are not, I mean, as you collect them, will they go back to um, the apartment? No, go back to the revolving loan fund itself. Go back into the revolving loan fund. To be re-loaned again if, if they pay. And remember, I think, remember early on, and, and I think things have shifted here, but early on this was a, an economic development type of a grant. It was, I won't say bad loans, but they were loans that helped um, breach, and we, we <coughs> subordinated ourselves sure. so that they could get the first one. So, I mean, it was designed for this kind of thing, and, and it's worked on, on some, and there's others we've written off that it hasn't worked. And it strictly has nothing to do with the people. It was other. It was more of a housekeeping. You know, when you look at the list, why have you got them on since 2002 and they haven't paid you? And, and that question always comes up whenever, you know, somebody looks at that and, and wonders. That's why uh, I said, well, okay, let's take it off right. and put it down. It's not, you know, that we won't collect if, again, as it's been stated, if it's paid and there's money left over. But it was just a housekeeping uh, type of uh, situation. So. Well, Jan, how, do, how does that... How do you handle that from the financial statements? For the financial statements, we would probably just set an allowance equal to the amount of the assets. So it would look at like a net zero on the books. Okay. So we'll, it will still be carried at cost, but the allowance will be equal, so they'll zero each other out. Okay. So we, we'll still track whenever any money comes in, the loan will be reduced. Um, as far as interest uh, cont continuing to accrue, I'm, yeah, I don't really know if there's any point in that we, at this time. We could always calculate the interest current should there be enough money in the sale to pay the interest off, but to continue to accrue the interest is is not a good business practice. I agree. And it just, it really, if you did accrue, continue to accrue the interest, it would just reduce the amount of money in the fund that could be reloaned out to other people who are needing and deserving of the, of the assistance. But I, but I think you see the need for policy, because you still have some active ones and... Um, right for one. Well, right for one, right for other. So let's, let's have a policy to say that at come a certain point we will trigger you all come forward with the write-off ban. It's consistent, it's fair, um, and, and the policy is very clear. And, so. we've, and we've had trouble in the past legally, so I'm sure our city attorneys are quite confident that, you know, that we are where we're supposed to be on that title and we know, you know, that we're listed there as one of the, the um, people that they owe debt. Our city attorneys did the paperwork when the law was made. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Let's move on. We've been here a long time. Absolutely. <laughs> Fair housing workshop, item 2F. Uh, Mayor and Council, uh, the, the city is preparing a CDBG ap application. It requires that and fair housing uh, may be one of the items we apply for it there. So it's a required as part of our application that the city conduct a fair housing workshop. Uh, for the public and uh, the elected officials. So, uh, Mr. Fox, uh, correct? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I'm David Fox with Fred Fox Enterprise. This is a fair housing workshop for our 2007 Community Development Block Grant application. Um, the city adopted a fair housing ordinance in, on November 4, 1991. The ordinance states that the city's policy to eliminate discrimination in housing based upon race, color, religion, sex, age, familiar status, handicap or national origin. Fair housing chapter also includes provisions for citizen complaints. Citizen ordinance states that if individuals have been discriminated against, they can file a written complaint with the city within 45 days of complaint and the city will investigate the complaint. 
Upon receipt of the complaint, the commission or its appointed board shall serve upon the individual charged with a violation. The complaint and written resume setting forth the rights of the parties, including but not limited to the right of the respondent to a hearing of the matter before adjudication by the commission or its appointed board. The commission or its appointed board shall immediately investigate the complaint. On 60 days from the day of the receipt of the complaint, the commission or appointed board shall establish a written report with finding of fact. The city deems the complaint justified. The city may ask the state attorney to look into prosecuting the person or person complaint is made against. Additionally, copies of the complaint may be obtained from the city. Is there any questions with your ordinance in place? Any comment? Questions? Any questions from anyone in the audience? Okay. Just to do a brief, I know it's fast, and to do a brief overview, this gives an avenue for people with complaints to go through. They feel like they're discriminated against. They can go to the city and written resume forth into a letter and complain about being discriminated against when renting or buying a house. They have 45 days from the time that they feel like they were discriminated against to submit this letter to the city. The city has 60 days to respond to the complaint in written form. If they don't respond in 60 days, then it's forwarded to the state's attorney's office. Now, what department in the city would this fall under? Yours, Rick? Yes. Okay. If there's no question, thank you, sir, Mr. Fox. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Linda, she's gone. Finance Committee, Miami-Dade County, Transit, Surtax, Proceeds, and Resolution, Tab 5. Mr. Mayor and Council, the recommendation is that Council authorize me to sign the interlocal agreement with Miami-Dade County for the distribution of our Transit Surtax money. We did have an original interlocal agreement. The county's come back and have adjusted that agreement, that interlocal agreement. Didn't take any money from it. Didn't take any money. It just basically the two major things is changing the reporting and how we report the money spent. And we do it now because they ask us for it quarterly, but it wasn't in the letter of agreement. So it states that will be the time frame for us to make our reports. It will be a quarterly basis. And then it states that the CITT has a right to audit whenever they want the citizens. I'll move the recommendation. Independent transportation. Moved by Mr. Porter, seconded by Mr. Hodge. Any further questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any business, Mr. Porter, for the committee? I would like, I'd like real quick, Mayor, in the future meeting, can we bring up a discussion about the sports page lounge and the calls to services for services and some of the activity? I've had some complaints over there and obviously had an officer involved shooting the other day. So it's a city owned and leased by the city to a proprietor. And if they're not operating within the rules or by the rules, then we should have some additional authorities. Mayor and Mr. Porter, we have initiated today with our attorneys to write a letter. We're removing them from the property. We have a month-to-month contract with them. Probably we'll want them out of there. I think the time frame is at the end of this month. I don't need, we don't have to meet on it then. I just think there's a problem. Yes, there is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Sorry. But to follow up with Jeff, there's a complaint I received from this facility in the southwest section. It's a lodge or something there off of 4th and the Elks Club. Could you all look into that? I've gotten several calls, Chief, from the Elks Club about activities at the Elks Club, fighting and just a whole host of things. So that's an area that we really need to pay close attention to. I've gotten some calls on that. That and those couple of apartments right before there. Basically where they walk over there, I think. So some people say they can't sleep. Seniors over there say they can't sleep at night, especially the weekends, because, you know, they have gunshots. I know our officers have been there on many occasions for fighting and what have you. So if we can get that resolved, I think it would be very helpful. Thank you, Mr. Porter. Ms. Garner, any business for Mr. Baldwin? No. Mr. Hodge? Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Ms. Bell? I just want to thank the council for their support on what was a very tough decision, and I want to thank everybody. Thank you, Ms. Bell. Good job. Mr. Manage, anything? Uh, just two quick things. Uh, one is, uh, you know, the cable legislation is up. I got a call from uh, Scott Maddox of the League of, League of Cities. Uh, we did send a letter up with everybody's name on it. The same thing that you had sent, Mayor, uh, to uh, <laughs> Senator Villalobos and, and uh, uh, another legislator because it's going before their committee objecting to it. Uh, but uh, Scott Maddox had asked if any of... Uh, any person from the council, they'd do it on their dime, would go up there and speak <coughs> against the legislation on Thursday at 2 p.m. They can make it a round trip, go up in the morning, come back in the this day. This Thursday? This coming Thursday. I'm leaving. Oh, I'm leaving to go up there on Monday. Okay. If, if you do, if you'll let me know maybe tomorrow if you think about it. To, they want to get cities, and uh, uh, Scott called us to be one of the people to talk uh, about the impact of that on the city. Uh, secondly, uh, our last, you know, we had eminent domain at the city hall site, the new, new site. We had one property left to, to finish off with the judge. Uh, I'll bring that before you Monday. I didn't, uh, I just found out this afternoon, couldn't get it on the agenda for tonight. Uh, and so those are the two things I had, Mayor. That's all. Thank you. Mr. Turney, any, any business? No, Mr. Mayor. Thank you all so very much for coming. The meeting is adjourned.